from the previous day's class. We shall be covering up spine. That is vestibular spinal reflex. Vestibular ocular reflex such a movement of head, but still fixating the vision. That is vestibular ocular reflex. And you can see, jokon our head aidike jatche, eyes oidike jatche. It's the opposite direction. And joto tuku dorka tatu to me camera dike taki, edike gure camera dike gelo, eyes taka tototai jata of a jotota, head aidike jatche. Clear. So corresponding angle in the opposite direction, eyes movement and head movement. That is vestibulo ocular reflex. Keu bole di chen, I am not measuring, ha, 25 degree edike jago, eyes taka 25 move kutta ave. It's happening unconsciously. So it is a reflex pathway. And since it is a reflex pathway, it will follow the rule of the reflexes. Mane akta afferent thakche, akta cell body thakche, akta efferent thakche, processor organ thakche, and end organ thakche. This, this is the whole process. Clear? It has a vestibulo ocular reflex. The second one is the vestibulo spinal reflex. Matha namacho eikocho body tar vivinno dike move hoche. Actually, what is happening? Your vestibular nucleus in body, in the brain, kothai takche, brain stem takche, that's the eighth nerve nucleus. It is finding out the difference in CG, difference in body position, and appropriate muscles, extensor or flexor muscles are contracted, and then your position is maintained. This is vestibular spinal reflex. He says to the oche, dorsal column, the vestibular, vestibular, the corticospinal, the shape particular muscle, the trunk muscle, the trunk Most of the time, this is a conjugate movement between the anterior corticospinal and lateral corticospinal. Mane motor track ta kaya kuchit. Connection ta bujat chishta kura. Ami jya body move kore chhi. Ehi movement te pore jat chhi na because of the vestibulospinal reflex. Ehi move kore ne kiyo chhe. Some other muscles, they have to be contracted. Otherwise, what will happen? My CG is here, but something is compensating my posture. What is compensating my posture? Three, four things are there, but most important one is the vestibulospinal reflex. What is that? Your sensory system is coming and reaching to the vestibular nerve and vestibular vestibular nucleus, they are sending to the appropriate spinal segment motor and that appropriate spinal segment motor is contracting the appropriate muscle. Otherwise, extensor muscle will tight track, otherwise you will fall down. Understood? So this is vestibular spinal reflex. Two types, vestibular ocular reflex, vestibular spinal reflex. Now coming to the vestibular apparatus, one of the most difficult areas. So, what is the vestibular apparatus? Inner ear, anatomical location, temporal bone, in between that, that is present. Kirokum dekte, the semicircle, kiki option ache, stint a semicircular canal ache, duto autolithic organ roach, three semicircular canal, two autolithic organ. With my limited drawing capacity, I am trying to draw right now. Okay, it's easiest. Amar moto jara ase limited drawing capacity, tadhi jono this is the easiest one. Jee hoyte kuchhi. So tinte semicircular canal ke we can. This is one vertical. This is one horizontal, and this is another oblique. Pinte semicircular canal bridge. Vertical, horizontal, oblique. Then we have two organs, acta ekhane, acta ekhane. Duto organ bridge. A jai gatai, no the jamon chai. Organ of corti and stuff ja se ase tak. The lower part of each semicircular canal that is thickened, that is swollen, and this is known as ampulla. Semicircular canal is the lower part, those are known as ampulla. Here we have a horizontal organ, here we have a vertical organ. These are the autolithic organ. Horizontal organ, the upper one is known as utricle. And the vertical one, lower one, is known as saccule. These are autolithic organ because carbonate crystals are present. The autoliths are present. These are the ear rock. 
chote 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 solid particles are present in the gel like structure which is present over there clear autolithic organic tale now to make it a little can make it like this puro ta jate dekhte bhalo lage canal gulo ke poishkar tumi bujhte parcho so it will make it a little like this so these are the tubes clear ei bare basic idea you need to identify semi circular canal if we have a cross section of semi circular canal it will look like this okay and in this you will be having a membrane er moddhe ekta membrane pacho which is puro ta ekta membrane thakche So it has a basic idea of the semicircular canal, the cross section column. Quite a few important things in most of those that you need to understand. Semicircular canal is not an autolithic organ, so you are not having the ear rocks or carbonate crystals inside them. What we have, we have hair cells. एक लोग चाहे hair cells. Hair cells are nothing but modified cilia. You can see ये जो cilia गुलो आँची, इर मुद्दे some cilia are shorter, some cilia is longer. जे जे लॉन्गेस्ट सिलिया इज नोन एज काइनोफिलियम लॉन्गेस्ट सिलिया इज नोन एज काइनोफिलियम ग्रुप ऑफ सिलियाज आर नोन एज स्टीरियोसिलियम सो दिस इज काइनोफिलियम एंड स्टीरियोसिलियम एंड दैट हेल्प्स इन यू नो रेस्टोरेशन ऑफ बैलेंस आई एम कमिंग टू दैट एवरे सिलिया गुलो रूपोरे इफ यू लुक एट इफ इट इज एट ऑल विजिबल from that side there is a blue color at a blue color er ekta portion ekechi and this is the gel structure cupula bole eta so this is the gel structure which is present on the hair cells this is the gel like structure jeta hair cells er upore present thakche gel clear next coming thing you can see a membrane inside membrane a different fluid outside membrane a different fluid ei je membrane ta ache outside membrane je fluid ta ache this is known as perilymph extra cellular fluid it are almost plasma or ultra filtered perilymph inside membrane je fluid ta ache this is known as endolymph and it is slightly different it is slightly different endolymph okay endolymph er jeta dekha jay je potassium concentration is much higher more viscous among different from the perilymph and it has a connection with the cupula mechanism and the hair cell এই অবধি প্রত্যেকের ক্লিয়ার তো পুরো জিনিসটা ক্লিয়ার হয়ে গেছে আরেকটা জিনিস ক্লিয়ার তো জেল হ্যাজ আ डिफरेंट ভিসকোসিটি দ্যান ওয়াটার অর এক্সট্রা সেলুলার ফ্লুইড অর প্লাজমা দিস ইজ ক্লিয়ার তাহলে একটা 
bottle and mode if we keep some gel and some water and if we move the bottle gel and water will move in a different direction and with different velocity clear ajishta because gel has a different inertia water has a different inertia bottle jokhoni move kora shuru korbo water will immediately start going downwards gel will take some time because the consistency of this fluid is different clear and this helps over here clear ebare cilia niche this is the cell body cilia gulo ebong shekhan theke we are having nerves nerve fiber kothay jacche ultimately these nerve fibers are creating eight nerve etai vestibular nerve toiri korche cell body gulo theke nerve jacche and when they are joining together they are creating the vestibular nerve clear vestibular nerve kothay jacche vestibular nucleus where it is present vestibular nucleus is present in the brain stem where in the brain stem forms medulla junction pondo medullary junction brain stem is vestibular nucleus roche clear i obvi so once again this is the vestibular apparatus in simplified form it has three semi circular canal semi circular canals are responsible to identify angular acceleration and deceleration angular acceleration and deceleration three semi circular canals each in a different plane act a vertical so it helps in understanding this acceleration and this deceleration act a horizontal so it helps in understanding this acceleration and this deceleration are act a perpendicular to this z axis x y axis er sathe z axis e royeche so this helps in this clear tinte side e bojhar jonno hocche ebare tumi bolte paro ei plane gulo chhara to ami korte pari this is a different tinte tinte plane miliye korchi to tinte er proportional movement hobe tinte theke action potential generate hobe and the resultant movement hobe clear both side e ei jinish ta ghotche tole first line ta clear hoye gelo second what about the horizontal velocity or vertical velocity eta ki z movement ta ke bojhe hocche semi circular canal কিন্তু ধরো ইফ ইউ আর ইন আ কার এন্ড দা কার মুভিং ফার্স্ট তোমার বডিটা ফার্স্ট এরকম পিছনে থাকলো পিছন থেকে সামনে এলো আবার ব্যাক করলো এই যে কার মুভমেন্ট করছে অর সাপোজ ইন আ লিফট এলিভেটর পুরো বডির উপরে যাচ্ছে পুরো বডি নামছে সো দিস হরিজন্টাল পিওর হরিজন্টাল এন্ড পিওর ভার্টিক্যাল মুভমেন্ট ইজ সেন্স বাই ইউট্রিকাল এন্ড স্যাকিউলি সেটার জন্য ওই সিস্টেমটা করা হয়েছে দিস সাচ এ কমপ্লেক্স সিস্টেম ইফ আই কান্ট ফিনিশ ইট উই উইল কন্টিনিউ ইন দা নেক্সট ক্লাস ইট ইজ ইট ইজ আ ভেরি কমপ্লেক্স সিস্টেম বেসিক্যালি সো ইউট্রিকাল এন্ড এন্ড বই পড়লে মনে হয় না কিছু বুঝবে কোন বই বই পড়ে বই পড়ে আমিও কোনদিন কিছু বুঝিনি এই জিনিসটা ইটস এ ভেরি কমপ্লেক্স ইটস এ থ্রি ডাইমেনশনাল থিং আনলেস ইউ আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড দিস ওয়ে ভেরি ডিফিকাল্ট টু আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড দ্যাট থিং সো উপরে যাচ্ছে বা গাড়িতে যাচ্ছে তার জন্য হরিজন্টাল বা ভার্টিক্যাল অ্যাক্সেলারেশন দ্যাট ইজ সেন্স বাই ইউট্রিকাল এন্ড স্যাকিউল হোয়াট ইজ দ্য বেসিক ডিফারেন্স বিটুইন ইউট্রিকাল এন্ড আই মিন হোয়াট ইজ দ্য বেসিক ডিফারেন্স বিটুইন অটোলিথিক অর্গান হুইচ ইজ ইউট্রিকাল এন্ড স্যাকিউল এন্ড দি সেমি সার্কুলার অর্গান দ্য বেসিক ডিফারেন্স ফার্স্ট অফ অল pure horizontal and vertical so straight line things are sensed by utricular and sacral angular and rotational things are sensed by semi circular canal secondly if we if we draw i mean inside a sacral tar ekta sacral by utrical motamoti eki anatomy is pri same only thing the position is different the organs are almost the same so utrical and sacral they are like this suppose this is, this is এটা হচ্ছে বেসিক স্ট্রাকচার বেসিক স্ট্রাকচার যেটা হরাইজেন্টাল আছে সেটা স্ট্রাকচার এই যেটা ধরো ভার্টিক্যাল আছে আছে সেটা স্ট্রাকচারটাও আছে বুঝতে সুবিধা হবে এটা হরাইজেন্টাল এটা ধরো ভার্টিক্যাল clear all of this picture is not completely perfect 
নীল দাগটা খাতায় আঁকার আগে একটু ওয়েট করো আমি সেটা বলে দেবো তারপরে আঁকবো নীল যে দাগটা এঁকেছি তার আগে একটু ওয়েট করো ট্রাই টু আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড হোয়াট ইউ আর সিং সেল সিলিয়া নার্ভস গোয়িং টু দি ভেস্টিবিউলার নার্ভ সেল সিলিয়া নার্ভস গোয়িং টু দি ভেস্টিবিউলার নার্ভ জেল লাইক স্ট্রাকচার ব্লুটা হচ্ছে জেল ব্লুটা হচ্ছে জেল ক্লিয়ার এন্ডোলিম টাইপেরই জেল অলমোস্ট সেম ভিস্কোসিটি ব্লুটা জেল ব্লুটা জেল হোয়াইট গুলো হচ্ছে ক্যালসিয়াম কার্বোনেট ক্রিস্টাল কার্বোনেট ক্রিস্টাল সেন্সাইড যেগুলো হচ্ছে অটোলিথ ইয়ার রক বলা হয় ছোট 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 ক্রিস্টাল নাও ইউ থিঙ্ক দিস ইজ অরাইজেন্টাল দিস ইজ ভার্টিক্যাল ইফ ইউ আর স্ট্যান্ডিং লাইক দিস ইউর হরাইজেন্টাল অর্গ্যান ইজ লাইক দিস ভার্টিক্যাল অর্গ্যান ইজ লাইক দিস সেম ইউ ইফ ইউ লাই ডাউন ইউর হরাইজেন্টাল উইল বি ভার্টিক্যাল ইউর ভার্টিক্যাল উইল বি হরাইজেন্টাল ক্লিয়ার clear in between position proportionate change in the position of this clear tale ei ei thakche puro shule ei hoye jacche majhe thakle erokom je kono position hocche and at this different position gel er shape o different hobe at this different position gel gulor shape tao different hobe try to understand jodi bola hoy why nature has provided us with autolith in autolithic organ and not in semicircular canal তাহলে আমাদেরকে ফার্স্টে বুঝতে হবে হোয়াট অটোলিথ ডু অটোলিথ কি করছে অটোলিথ সলিড তো সো দে হ্যাভ সাম ওয়েট সাম মাস তো যখন নাও ইউ উইল আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড দিস কেউ এক যার ভার্টিক্যালটা এরকম রয়েছে ধরো ভার্টিক্যাল অর্গান এভরিবডি ক্যান সি দা ভার্টিক্যাল অর্গান মোটামুটি ম্যাক্সিমাম দেখতে পাচ্ছ ভার্টিক্যাল অর্গানটা এরকম রয়েছে অটোলিথ কি করবে অটোলিথ গুলো নিচের দিকে আসবে অটোলিথ আর সলিড গ্র্যাভিটি সো মোর অ্যান্ড মোর অটোলিথ উইল কম্প্রেস দিস what will happen cilia will bend cilia will bend with the weight of the autolith and this fluid fluid ta ki hobe fluid o niche dikhe ashbe fluid o niche dikhe ashbe because of the because of the gravity so actual picture of this fluid will be a pear shaped tai na actual actual ta to erokom hobe fluid ta tumi jodi abar body ta ke upore dikhe tolo fluid ta abar position ta change korbe the moment fluid changes the position autolith will also move autolith will also barge on the cilia and autolith will barge on the cilia ciliary movements will happen ciliary bending will happen a puro vestibular apparatus a how things process whenever cilia bends physical force developed physical force is conducted into depolarization depolarization causes the action potential in the nerve fiber this action potential is taken via the vestibular nerve to the vestibular nucleus that's the process abar bojhar chesta koro ei puro system er moddhe ektu age je prashno ta korlam je autolith e autolith ache keno kintu okhane autolith nei keno reason most likely reason is tomar ekhane angular acceleration ta pachcho and it is easy to move with angular acceleration autolithic organ are more for static so you know acceleration ta oi bhabe pacche na nature has provided autolith to make it more sensitive ami jodi ektu beshi ojoner kichu di tobe gravity only gravity is acting over here so that's why i have given certain extra particle to make it make the whole apparatus more sensitive in linear thing in the angular thing we don't require because the thing is under gravity and under acceleration in various things or various direction that's why autolith is not required in the scc clear abar jacchi whole system ta ki kore kaaj korche cilia bend hocche due to inertia because jedike move korbe first try to understand suppose this is the semicircular canal you are moving your head to the right the moment you are moving your head to the right what will happen to the semicircular canal and the perilymph it will move in this direction matha je moment e right e jacche semicircular canal and horizontal cross section ekechi this is a horizontal semicircular canal cross section ekechi matha je moment e right e jacche what is happening semicircular canal right side e semicircular canal right e jacche if you are moving your head on the right side your right side of semicircular canal is also moving to the right side clear but this endolymph has a different viscosity that's why it is under a different inertia তো তোমার এটা যখন এদিকে মুভ করবে এন্ডোলিমটা অপোজিট দিকে মুভ করবে ডিউ টু দি ওয়েট অফ দি এন্ডোলিম ডিউ টু দি ভিসকোসিটি অফ দি এন্ডোলিম ক্লিয়ার एवरीबॉडी এটা যখন রাইট সাইডে মুভ করছে এন্ডোলিমটা উল্টো দিকে মুভ করছে দা মোমেন্ট এন্ডোলিম মুভস ইন দি অপোজিট ডিরেকশন হোয়াট উইল হ্যাপেন এইটা সেমি সার্কুলার ক্যানাল ইজ মুভিং টু দিস ডিরেকশন 
endolymph is either stationary or moving to the opposite direction initially this endolymph will pressurize here create the pressure on the cilia the moment endolymph the moment endolymph will create the pressure kahan ki hocche they will bend endolymph ta giye jodi hair cell these are the hair cell on it if it creates the pressure hair cell will bend the picture will be this when they will bend the picture will be clear it will bend it will create a pressure it will create a dislodgement kon dike bend korche towards the kinocilia or away from the kinocilia towards the kinocilia khub interesting bhabe jinish ta kora jokhon if to if the movement of endolymph is towards the kinocilia longest tallest cilia there will be depolarization if it is away from the kinocilia there will be repolarization try to understand jokhon ei diktate right side e towards the kinocilia move korche similar apparatus left side e away from the kinocilia move korbe tai na similar side left side e away from the kinocilia move korbe so right side e towards kinocilia left side e away from the kinocilia right side e depolarization left side e repolarization so right vestibular nerve e depolarization action potential prochur beshi toiri hocche left ventricular nerve e vestibular nerve we are having hyperpolarization so shekhane inhibition hocche that's the idea so far clear a of this clear to everybody understood ha huh? we are here to cover this particular part of nose paranasal sinus this is one of the important exam question area where we see these exam questions are teaching every time and as well as this is one of the topic which is important for our clinical life as well we see number of patients coming with this particular problem related to the nose paranasal sinus infections etc etc it could be like a the trauma which might be involving in this particular nose nasal region because this is the part of the face which is projected and this particular part is prone to have infection because of the exposure to this exterior because this is a organ of respiration so there are number of clinical variables are there related to this particular part and as well as we see this particular clinical question based on this coming on testing your anatomy knowledge as well So our point of concern today will be covering this particular nose. We'll be focusing on the skeleton of the nose, exterior of the nose, interior of the nose, nasal septum, how it is participating, how it is forming, the blood supply of the nose or interior of the nose, the nerve supply of it, which is related to this particular interior of the nose and as well as septum. Now then, once we have covered this part of the septum and all these nasal cavity, we'll be moving to the expansions of the nasal cavity. We call them as paranasal expansion cavities. We call them as the sinuses and the opening of the sinuses. If they are blocked, if this particular thing is clinically uh, challenged in terms of infections, etc., etc., then we have to have this particular clinical problem based on this. so this is the point of concern so first we cover the nose and the nasal cavity then we move to this particular paranasal sinuses so to start it we have to understand this particular skeleton of the nose which is constituting of partly cartilage partly bone so there are some external or extrinsic skeletal network is there which this particular nose is forming and as you know this particular nose is an organ of respiration we breathe in breathe out along with that inside to this particular nasal cavity we have a cranial nerve place which is an olfaction which is the cranial nerve number 2 so which is organ of olfaction or smell is there along with that this particular entry point of this air which have got like a functions which is humidified or dehumidifying the air what do you mean by the humidifying or dehumidifying Now, depending on the environment, depending on the moisture we have there in our environment, that is getting into this particular nasal cavity to the respiratory tract. Now, we need a particular pH, or we need a particular amount of the oxygen, and as well as we need a particular amount of the moisture in it. So, if we have excess moisture to exposed to this respiratory system, which is stressful, if we have less moisture, which is also a troublesome thing. So, we have to have a proper balance, proper. proper quotient of the moisture there so if we have exposed to the dry environment we have this particular nose and paranasal sinus which is secreting making this particular air moist 
And if it is exposed to a moist weather, right now, what we are going through is a very humid and moist conditions. This particular nasal mucosa and this component within this particular nasal mucosa absorbs some amount of this particular moisture from the air and delivers the absorbed air or purified air to this particular respiratory system. Along with that, it takes the dust away, micro dust which is present in the air, which is filtering it and letting it get into our respiratory system, the lungs, etc, etc. So, these are the gross functions of this particular nose and nasal cavity and this particular the paranasal sinuses, etc, etc. Now, our concern is that we will be talking about this particular skeleton of the nose or exterior of the nose. So, we have a skeleton of the nose which is made of the external bones or the exterior bones. So, we have also mentioned this exterior or the external nose having two kind of skeleton element which is made of bone which is made of cartilages. So, partly cartilage, partly bone framing this entire network. There are number of bones which is forming it, there are number of cartilage which is forming here. So, we have this particular bone related to the nose which is known as nasal bone which is present in the nose which is framing it. Along with that the projections and contributions they are coming from the maxilla, frontal bone, nasal spine they are contributing to it and forming this external skeleton of the nose. And along with that we have the cartilages which is present, we call them as lateral cartilage, septal cartilage which is forming this. But before we going into it, we have to know, understand different parts of the nose. The part of the nose which is related to the, attached to this particular forehead, we call them as a root. And whereas this particular downward most position, we call them as tip of the nose. And in between tip of the nose and the root of the nose, we have this body of the nose, we call them as dorsum. The projected side of the nose, we call them as ala of the nose. We are familiar with the word ala, which is looks like a wing, which has the nasal expansion which is coming on the side which is known as ala of the nose. Now, if we go on the skeletal system which is forming here which I am mentioning it is same with this particular bone which is forming the upper table of this nasal septum or the upper table of this particular external nose. So, this is the nasal bone which is making over here right left and this particular bone is coming from this maxilla. So, we call them as nasal part or, 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 or frontal process of the maxilla which is coming over there. This is frontal bone which is going down and making this particular part. We call them a nasal part of the frontal bone making a union over there and nasal spine which is present in this particular region. So, this is a skeletal network made of bones over there. Then we go down in the lower part which is made of partly cartilage and we have contributions in between different types of cartilage. In the midline we have a nasal septum. We have to learn a detail about the nasal septum which is another cartilage which is hanging down. On this side we have the lateral plates or lateral septal cartilage. Then we have the alar cartilage which is making this particular different skeletal element of this particular nose or nasal cavity. Now you are getting into this particular important part for our understanding we call them as nasal septum which is splitting this nasal cavity into two halves, right half and the left half. Again, just like the exterior of the nose, the nasal septum is also partly bony, partly skeletal. The anterior part, just like the external nose, is made of cartilage. The posterior half of the nasal septum is made of, made of this particular bone. And this part we have to understand to understand the clinical problem. If you see this particular cross section picture, this is exposed with this nasal septum. We cannot see the lateral wall in this and we have used different colors to project it to understand it better. As I have said, this anterior part of the nasal septum, which is blue in color, you are saying here, is made of the cartilage. We call them a septal cartilage. It is a single plate of cartilage. Now, this posterior part of the nasal septum is made of bone. There are two bones which are making contributions over there. One single piece of bone which is making this particular contribution from the septum on the posterior inferiorly and on this posterior superiorly, there have another bone which is making here which is marked with the green line and this pink line. This particular bone which is making in the posterior inferiorly, we call them as vomer, which is resting on this particular palatine bone. So, this particular vomer is making this particular region septum which is below and above by this particular perpendicular plate of ethmoid. Now, this particular perpendicular plate of ethmoid, you see that is continuous with this another plate of ethmoid, we call them as cribriform plate of ethmoid. Now, this anatomy helps us to understand. Now, through this cribriform plate of ethmoid, which is sieved, that means it's porous, we have this olfactory nerve runs from here 
and goes to the brain cavity. So over here is this cranial cavity which you are exposed to. Now, if you are exposed to any kind of trauma or not trauma, if we have injury to this perpendicular plate of ethmoid, injuring these bony ends, if you have this particular thing exposed, that can rip and this injure the structure which is lying on top of it. So we'll be coming again when you are going to discuss some clinical problem with regard to this particular cubiform plate of ethmoid and perpendicular plate of ethmoid. So this septum or septal cartilage architecture, we had no. Moving from here, this particular nasal cavity is exposed on having two kinds of opening. One is the anterior opening, one is posterior opening. Anterior nasal opening, we can see. It's a visible part of this. If we throw light through this particular anterior nasal opening, we can see a part of this nasal cavity as well. The posterior nasal opening, normally we do not see. That part of the posterior nasal cavity or posterior nasal opening, which is lying on the posterior side, this is the opening which you're seeing here. I'm marking over here. This opening, we call them as quane or posterior nasal opening. Through this opening, it enters to a space we call them as nosopharynx. We have seen a number of features present on the nosopharynx, which is present on the lateral wall of the nosopharynx, which is opening of the eustachian tube, which is communicating with the middle ear, and as well as the pores, as well as the lymphoid aggregates, adenoids, etc., etc. Those part we already have covered. So this particular anterior nasal opening and the posterior nasal opening, both are important. Anterior one is accessible part, posterior wall is non-accessible part. But yet, in our clinical examination part, we have to see this posterior nasal opening. We cannot see that normally. Then, we have to, if we have to see, we have to go for invasion. That means we have to invade some part. To see this particular posterior nasal opening, normally we do here, we do it by a either by endoscopic process or using some kind of mirror. We call them as posterior nasal sinus or PNS mirror. We have a mirror which has fitted with this particular long string like this, stick like this, and then this mirror is placed to the oral cavity and placed over here. And if it is projected like submarine mirror, which is projecting up, we can see the posterior nasal opening and the nasal pharynx can be seen. This was the old way of seeing this with this PANS mirror. Nowadays, we have the endoscopes to just like a, can we can pass it through the nasal cavity or we can pass through the oral cavity and move it up because this particular endoscope, which is fiber optic, can be moved in different directions and can be seen. So this nasal openings, anterior and posterior and posterior nasal opening, clinically, we do not call it posterior nasal opening. We call the word as QNI, C-H-O-N-I-E. That particular word, is used in a clinical settings whenever we are exposed to it or whenever we require to address that part. Now, coming to the other boundaries of the nasal cavity, it has a roof, it has a floor, it has a lateral wall and a medial wall. We'll be exposing one after another. It has a roof, which you can see here, which is related to this particular base of the bone skull. That means it is related to the sphenoid bone. It is related to this particular ethmoid bone. We already have seen that perpendicular fluid of ethmoid. In the front side, we have the frontal bone, which is related to it. It has a floor. It is resting on the hard palate, which is making this particular floor separating from the oral cavity. It has a septum, which is splitting it into two halves, anterior and right and left septum over there. We have the medial septum, which is exposing here. And it also has a lateral wall. So these features which is present on the lateral wall is or are our exam question. We have to understand this lateral wall well enough to understand the clinical problems. We understand this particular anatomical problems. Now, this lateral wall of the nose exposes this particular region. We see this particular number of the bones which is hanging on lateral wall of the nose. How we can see this lateral wall of the nose? Only if you remove this particular nasal septum and cut it and split it and see it on the lateral wall, then it's visible. Beforehand, we have this particular picture where we have this particular nasal septum intact. So this is what we are seeing here before, the nasal septum in place. You crack this particular nasal septum, then we can see the lateral wall of the nose on the right side or the left side. So this is how we are seeing here. Within this particular lateral wall of the nose, we see there are kind of scroll-like bones which is overhanging. This scroll-like over or kind of like a curled kind of bones which is hanging over here, we call this as concha. So this particular concas above and below, they are placed like this. There are three such bone placed over there. One is one, two, and three. Out of this particular three, the lowest one is kind of like a prominent one and the largest one. That's why 
whenever you are seeing that in a clinical setting, whenever we have split this and we are seeing this lateral wall of the nose, this one is obvious and visible very much. These two are brittle and small. Whenever we are making the section, this particular bone cracks. So many a times you may not see these particular bones whenever you are doing the anatomical section, but they are there. So coming back to the lateral wall of the nose, that's what we're seeing here. On the lateral wall of the nose, we're seeing the three piece of the bone. We call them as conchas. And above below, we call them a superior concha. Then we have the middle concha. And the largest of all is inferior concha. The superior concha and the middle, inferior, middle concha is basically a part of ethmoidal bone, which is projecting out. And inferior concha is a separate piece of bone. And it can be separated out from rest of them. So this particular entity, you have to know what do you mean by the concha and how this particular thing is placed on the lateral wall of the nose above the lobe. Now, if you have placed this particular entire thing on the lateral wall of the nose, this particular concha splits this particular lateral wall of the nose into some spaces. We call these as spaces as mehetas. So under or above this particular concha, we have this particular spaces which is related to this particular lateral wall of the nose we call them as mehetas. So, under or above this particular conquer the space, accordingly, we name that superior mehetas, inferior mehetas, and middle mehetas likewise. So, this particular thing makes us clear about this particular mehetas and this particular conquer. So, this is a superior mehetas, this is a middle mehetas, and this is the inferior mehetas. The space under to it, this inferior conquer, we call them as inferior mehetas. The space between this middle concha and the space and, with, and inferior concha, we call them as middle meters. The space which is lying between this middle concha and this particular superior concha, we call them as superior meters. And this particular space, which is a very tiny space, which is lying on top of this particular superior concha, we call them as supreme meters, also known as phenoethmoidal recess. So we should have a clear idea what do you mean by the concha which is a piece of the bone and what do we mean by this particular space they are lying between these particular conchas which are known as meters. How many conchas are there? How many meters are there? And what are the features that drives here in terms of the anatomy knowledge is concerned to understand the clinical of this particular region. Now normally in a living condition this particular conchas are covered or blanketed by the mucosal covering the mucosal covering means this is covered with the mucosa blood vessels soft tissue structure which you have got bloods and nerves supplying to it that means it's a living tissue which is carpeted there and this particular thing is wrapped around normally we do not see the bones exposed unless until we make the bone dry and look like this so this is a dry bone specimen where you see this particular conchas like the bones how they are there superior, middle and inferior concha and the space between them we call them as meatus, supreme, superior meatus, middle meatus and inferior meatus like this. So this is the dry bone specimen, how it looks like and this is a living specimen. This particular thing which you are familiar with, we have a cross section, sagittal section like this. If you haven't seen that, we'll be exposing that to see you as well. I think you have already seen that and this particular inferior concha we already have seen that they're very much prominently present. So the space above this particular inferior meters, we call them as middle meters. Uh, inferior concha, we call them as middle meters. The space below this particular middle uh, inferior concha, we call them as inferior meters, etc., etc. So these are the conchas, which is the bones. These are the meters, which are the recess of the space placed between them or under to them. And this particular out of these, the inferior concha is largest one and broadest one is visible, more pronounced amongst this particular spaces which is concerned. Once we have this particular space, this particular space is not an empty space. There are some opening of some sinuses or something which is getting into it. So that's what we have to understand that each particular space, what the feature that is present on it. So we take each of the space and learn about this particular special feature of this particular spaces which is related to it. So we take this particular supreme meters or sphenoethmoidal recess. The space that means lying above the superior concha, we call them as phenoethmoidal recess. That means it's bounded above by this particular roof of the roof of the nasal cavity. That means the sphenoid bone, this particular body of the sphenoid bone, which is making the roof, and this below it is limited by the superior concha. In between them, we have a very tiny cleft there, which is known as phenoethmoidal recess. Now, within this particular sphenoethmoidal recess, we see an opening coming here, which is coming from this particular sphenoidal air sinus cells. 
we call them a sphenoidal sinus. This is a space which is lying within this body of the sphenoid and this particular body of the sphenoid space is also lined or covered by this mucosa that makes this particular space is called a sphenoidal sinus and this particular sinus opens into the sphenoidal recess. What do you mean by that? The air gets into this nose and gets into this particular sinus and gets out. So functions of the sphenoid is humidification, purification of the air, etc, etc. And as well as give this particular bone or make this particular skeletal bone lightweight. So this particular sinus, which is having this particular cavity within this sphenoid bone, we call them a sphenoidal air sinus, which has an opening, which is communicating with this sphenoid model recess. So which is communicated with it. Now, we have this particular other sinus, which is known as superior meatus, which is another meatus. That means this particular meatus, which is lying under the superior concha. So it is lying between the superior concha and middle concha. This is a narrow space. Within this particular narrow space, superior concha, we see that the opening of the posterior ethmoidal air group sinus that is opening into it. Similar to this middle concha and this particular inferior concha, in between them, we have this particular space, we call them as middle meatus. Within this particular middle meatus, which has an additional feature, itself the middle meatus, the lateral wall of the middle meatus, the features on it, itself could be exam break point short note, like features which is there. Within this particular middle meatus, which is a, like a little bit broader, we see a cleft or semi-lunar cleft there, which is opening in here. We see a bony cleft or kind of like a gap which is present within this particular middle nasal meatus. This gap which you see here, we call them as hiatus semilunaries. So this particular gap which you're seeing here, which is present in this particular region, we call them as hiatus. So this particular hiatus looks like a half up of the moon, that's why you call them as hiatus semilunaries or semilunar hiatus. Within this particular hiatus, we can see that there's a, above this, we have a bulging of the bone, we call them as bulla of ethmoid bone. So this particular bulla of the ethmoid bone, which is ethmoid infundibulum, which is bulging into it. Within this particular ethmoidal bulla, which is lying over here, anterior part, we have an opening of these ethmoidal air cells. Anterior ethmoidal air cells and the frontal nasal sinus or frontal sinus, which is opening into it through this frontal nasal duct. And then into this particular hiatus or the gap, we have the opening of the maxillary sinus and middle ethmoidal sinus. So we'll be coming into the sinuses, then this particular opening will be more meaningful to understand what this particular sinus and how this particular sinus. What you are seeing here, the opening or draining pool of this particular sinus into this particular space. Now we are left with the inferior meatus. Inferior meatus, which is lying below the inferior concha, this particular space is opening over here, lying here, is coming from the nasolacrimal duct. That means whatever the tear that is coming, it is coming from this particular lacrimal gland, running through this particular external aspects of this orbit or eyeball, sorry, eyeball and scrolling to the medial end of this particular eye and this we call them as angle of the eye. We have a collecting point over there, we call them as puncta and through this puncta it is draining through this tube, we call them as nasolacrimal duct. Now this nasolacrimal duct opens into the inferior nasal meatus. So these are the different opening of this different, uh, dif these are the different meters which receives the opening of various or several substances. We'll be talking about this particular opening and then we'll go to this particular sinus. Then we will clarify more about this particular spaces and this opening. Coming from here, going to talk about the mucosa. As I am saying, this particular bones which you have, the conchas and the septum and everything, the bony skeleton is carpeted by this particular mucus. That means we have the blood vessels, nerves, everything present within this particular live tissue, which is the mucous membrane, which is covering into it. So we have basically this particular mucus, which is wrapping around, give this particular region a texture, which is a moist texture. Now there are two types of the mucosa, which is present in here. The majority of the mucosa, which is lined over here, we see that this is blue. And this is red, which is lying on the posterior or superior, or posterior superior aspect of the nose or nasal cavity, which is related to the roof of the nose. So there are two distinct points about this particular mucosa, which is lying in the rest of it and the superior part of it. Now, what are the importance here? Whenever we are doing this clinical surgery, this demarcation matters. Reason we will talking about. Now, this particular nasal mucosa is highly, highly vascular. This is visible. If you throw light through your external nasal cavity opening to the nasal part, you will see it's red. 
the mucosa it's very red out there so it is kind of like a highly vascular you, you if you see that particular mucosa now which is the mucosa that is lying on this region that means it's lying to the roof part it is avascular or less vascular this demarcation is very striking and we can see that when we are doing the surgery now this demarcation we have to understand when we are doing the surgery because in this region the mucosa we call call them as olfactory mucosa this olfactory mucosa are neural tissue rich that means we have the tons of nerves which is present on this particular region and this nerve which is coming here is olfactory nerves by doing any surgery in the nose region if you are doing any surgery in high nasal region in this roof region if you scoop too much region we lose this olfactory nerves and eventually the patient loses the smell power so this thing you have to keep in mind when you're doing surgery the rest part of the mucosa is vascular that means it's highly vascular and it is very fragile and a moist muc mucosa because it's tons of mucus secreting glands which is present in there so this respiratory mucosa demarcations of the respiratory mucosa matters clinically and as well as you have to understand these demarcations of this mucosa which part is lying with this vascular mucosa and which part is avascular mucosa and why as i'm mentioning this thing highly vascular that means we have a tons of blood flow which is coming here we have six to seven arteries feeding this particular nose and nasal cavity and this region we have a branches from different arteries pouring into and making this particular entire mucosa highly vascular take it what if you have a highly vascular mucosa, if you have any breach into this point, a point millimeter breach will lead to heavy, heavy bleeding. That's why anything, if it is bleeding inside the nose, it bleeds really heavy. That's what we have been learn over here. We have the three sets of the arteries coming from facial artery, coming from the maxillary artery and ophthalmic artery. They are pouring the blood flow into this highly vascular nasal mucosa. We call them as anterior and posterior ethmoidal artery. They are coming from these olfactory arterial branches. Maxillary artery sits the branches, which is related to the palatine, greater palatine, spinopalatine artery. And the spatial artery gives the labial branches of the artery and the lateral nasal branches. All these branches network towards it. And anastomose within this particular nasal mucosa vascular part and supplies this region. Reason for this, they, this particular region of this have vascular and as a result of this, this same architecture of this, of this particular arterial network also exists within this particular nasal septum. Now we see this nasal septum, we have seen that it can be divided into two parts, anterior part and the posterior part. Anterior part of the nasal septum, as you see, the anteriorly we have this particular point where it is circled over there. This circled area on the anterior part of the nasal mucosa where we see that anastomosis of these particular six arterial branches coming together and making this anastomosis point over here, giving a name there, we call them as Kesselbach area. So Kesselbach is a German physician who basically devised and figured out this particular region. Now we see this particular region, anterior part of the nasal cavity, which has got anastomosis over there, is very prone to have injuries. We'll talk about this particular injuries in two aspects. Now, as I'm mentioning, this is related to the anterior part of the nasal mucosa. That means this is an accessible part of the nasal part. That means the kids which are, which, who are prone to have injuries into it. How? The kids already, most of the times we see that the kids have a curious nature and they have a habit of poking nose. Many of us, us also have the habit of. But anyways, the kids have a basically more intent to have the poking nature towards the nose. They poke this and they have this particular nails, which is relatively sharper. And they bridge this particular region. And if you bridge this particular Kessel's back region, which is a highly anastomotic region of this, and it bleeds. And that's why this bleeding, which is coming from this Kessel's back region, we call them as epistaxis, is very more common in case of the children. So this is one entity. This other entity is there, the older individual, where they have this particular blood, blood resistance is very high. That leads to this particular vascular hypertension. We call them as essential hypertension. So old elderly individual, again, if they have this particular high blood pressure, this particular blood vessels, which is present in the Kessel's region, can rip. Again, it can bleed. And if it is ripping and if it is bleeding, again, it can lead to this phenomenon we call them as epistaxis. 
So this particular phenomenon, which is involving the rupture of the ripping of these blood vessels into this particular cases bag region, we call them as a fixed axis, prone individual or kids or elderly, depending on the two different entities on this. Now, this is one of the explain why kind of question they give in the examination. Like, a, like epistaxis is more prone or more common in children, and epistaxis is more common in older individuals. You have to explain it with this anatomical basis, how this particular blood vessel, which area is there within this particular nasal septum, how this particular thing is related to this particular bleeding. Coming from this interior of the nasal supply to the exterior of the nasal supply. The outside of the nose is supplied with this particular nasal artery, which is supplying to it. We call them as dorsal nasal artery, branch of ophthalmic artery, lateral nasal artery, etc., etc. They are supplying to it. The exterior of the nose is not that important clinically, but this particular exterior of the nose is more important in terms of the venous drainage. Now, this particular region of the exterior of the nose, all the blood vessels which is coming from the exterior of the nose to the interior of the nose they join together and drain to a group of lymphatics which is known as sphenopalatine veins. Now this particular sphenopalatine veins drains to the deep facial veins and ophthalmic veins. Now take it what, this particular vein network which is coming from the exterior of the nose and as well as interior of the nose, they join together, make this particular veins and they drain to this area of the venous drainage, we call them as cavernous sinus. So as a result of this, if you have this particular area of this nose or this particular interior and exterior of this particular nose, it's exposed to have infections because of this particular vein, which is coming over here, forming a vein, which is known as ophthalmic vein, forming a vein, sphelopalatine vein, forming a vein, which is deep facial vein. They are connected to deep veins in the brain, which is known as cavernous sinus. As a result of this, all this particular blood which is flowing on carry the infection from this nose, nasal cavity can take this particular infection to the central nervous system. And as a result of that, this particular cavernous sinus may be infected and leading to this particular uh, critical clinical condition. We call them as cavernous sinus thrombosis. So that's why this particular nose region and as well as this particular upper rib region, we call them as danger region of the face. We learn about in, in a face description region. So again, this thing again comes over here, danger area of the face, why it is important, how this infection from the danger area of the face and the nose reach and travels to this brain region through which number of veins. So this is how we have to explain. And majority of the times you're listening or not listening, doesn't matter, you should be able to answer it properly. If you are not writing it properly, you won't be getting credited for this. Okay, so prepare it very well about this danger area of the nose and how come this particular danger area is called danger area. What do you mean by this? Now, coming from the vascular supply to this particular nerve supply, the interior of the nose region, we have this olfaction. This is taking part of this particular special sensation. But the interior of the nose also have the General sensation as well, touch, pain, temperature, whatever the sensation is there, that has to be carried through some nerves. So this particular interior of the nose can be divided into two parts by this particular line which is splitting here, bottom part and above part. Above part of this nasal cavity which is lying over here is drained by some nerves which is taking the sensation there. The bottom part is taken by another nerve. So this nerve which is taking the sensation from the above part of this part of the nasal cavity, which is taking the touch, pain and temperature sensation is coming through V1 or ophthalmic division, which is coming from bottom part, which is coming from the lower part of the nasal cavity, which is going through the V2, that means the maxillary division. The maxillary division of Maxillary division of pregeminal nerve. So this mucosa, the sensory supply, differ from the above and below how these things are taken to it. And this is where we are talking about the olfactions, which is prime important for us. We understand this particular olfaction is taken by this olfactory nerves, which is housed within this olfactory mucosa. We know where is the olfactory mucosa is placed and how this particular olfactory nerves coming from this particular, like a periphery from this region, taking to this 
TP from plate of ethmoid going to this particular olfactory bulb and drains this region. Now, this is the exterior of the nose which is supplying to it rest all part of the nose supplied by the V1 that means this particular ophthalmic division. The ala of the nose, the spreaded part of the nose is taking the sensation from this V2. Coming from this lymphatic drainage, the vestibule part which is lying here on this particular exterior nasal opening is draining this lymphatic drainage into this particular submandibular group of lone nodes below this particular region. So if you have a boil or pimple in this region, the submandibular group of lymph nodes will be enlarged. Rest part of the nasal part, vestibule, root of the nose, dorsum of the nose, everything drains to deeper group of lymph nodes which is going into it. Back up, nahi, Back up, nahi. Nahi. Coming to what is important for us again, forming from the nasal cavity, architecture, clinical part into here, we call them as paranasal sinuses. This is what you have to understand. This is a 3D picture which is expect, which is projecting something like that. Not exactly, but maybe just like a represent the majority of the understanding of this paranasal sinus. Now, what do you mean by the paranasal sinus? You have to know this, what is it? So, this particular nasal mucosa, which is present within this particular nasal cavity. Now, this respiratory cavity, as it is growing with this time, facial skeleton is growing, this nasal mucosa is expanding as well. Now, this nasal mucosal expansion is going on different direction as we go. So, whatever the surrounding bone to this particular nasal cavity we have, the nasal mucosa grows into it. Now, as this particular nasal mucosa grows into the surrounding bone, it creates a cavity within this neighborhood bone, which is next to the nasal cavity. So, what are the neighborhood bones which is related to the nasal cavity? On top, we have the sphenoid bone and the frontal bone. It grows into them. And this particular expansions of the nasal mucosa getting into it and make some kind of chamber which is lying there. This particular nasal mucosa expands laterally, moves to this particular maxilla on the right side and left side towards this particular cheekbone, zygomatic bone as well. It, this nasal mucosa expands posteriorly. We get this bone which is known as ethmoid group of cells which is present there. That part also invaded by this nasal mucosa. As this nasal mucosa is growing, invading and getting into this particular bones, getting into this particular bones, they are housed and grows into. So we call this particular expansions or respiratory expansion of, expansion of the nasal mucosa as paranasal sinuses. Now this particular paranasal sinuses are, now this particular paranasal sinuses are also lined or covered by the same nasal mucosa. That means this nasal mucosa, the epithelium or this particular blood vessels and the nerve supply which is coming from here also grows into the nearby bones and over here. So from this nasal mucosa inside, it is moving up, getting to this frontal bone, creates a sinus within this frontal bone. We call them as frontal nasal sinus. If it is going backwards into this particular, on into this particular region, we call them as a ethmoidal group. It is moving above and this particular posterior direction, we call them as phenoidal air sinuses. If it is moving on the lateral side, we call them as the maxillary nasal sinuses. So it is growing into na different neighbor bones and grows into it. So we take each of these particular nasal sinuses and understand what this particular sinus is holding out here. So as I am saying this particular nasal mucosa which is coming from the nasal cavity moving above into this frontal bone and makes this particular ch chamber or cavity in some part of this particular frontal bone which is lying in the front side we call them a frontal sinus. So this particular frontal sinus is growing into this particular nasal sinus, uh, growing into this frontal bone, has a communication down to this particular nasal mucosa. So it is from opening into this particular superior meter where this particular nasal sinus frontal region is draining into it. This is one of the sinus which is present in the frontal bone, which is draining to the frontal nasal duct and opens into the middle, middle meter, sorry, middle meter through this hiatus semilunaris. Ethmoidal cells. Within this particular ethmoid bone, the sinus is growing and this particular sinus can be have divided into three parts. We do not want to complicate at this level because in the ENT sessions, we learn these different parts of this ethmoidal sinus. But for clerical distributions, we have this particular sinus divided into anterior part, posterior part and in between posterior and anterior part, we have this middle part. It looks like a bunch of grapes, this particular ethmoidal ethmoidal air cells which grows like a bunch of grapes having a stalk attached to it.
Now this particular sinuses, which is ethmoidal air sinuses, anterior, middle and the posterior, they also drain into this nasal cavity within this particular meatus. This particular anterior meatus and the middle meatus, they drain mostly into this particular individually or collectively into the space we call them as middle meatus. The posterior one drains to the superior middle meatus, a superior meatus. Now coming from this meatus we talked about, it is growing above and posteriorly into the sphenoid bone or body of the sphenoid grows in there and hold a sinus space there. We call them as sphenoidal sinus. This particular sphenoidal sinus opens into supreme meatus, also known as sphenoidal meatus. Now most important to us, this is also we see that the exam question are asking about this describe of the sinus which is involving this particular middle sinus. So middle, middle meatus which is opening here. So this particular meatus which is lying on the maxilla bone is largest of all, is earliest to develop and when we are born nearly by the age of one year it has a normal adult size nearly. So this particular maxillary sinus which eventually grows, eventually grows into this particular maxilla which is lying over there. It looks like a D-shaped structure. You see this particular skyogram picture. This is not a skyogram, this is a CT, uh, this is an MRI section which is a cut, cutting through the sinuses which is exposing different sinus. So this is orbit which you are seeing here, right and left orbit, this is the nasal cavity, the septum which you are seeing here, the conchas are visible and you can see that this particular space which is lying on side of here, we have the maxilla bone. So within this maxilla bone, right and left, maxillary sinus is there. The detailed anatomy of the maxillary sinus we have to know. What are the boundaries of the maxillary sinus? What makes this particular maxillary sinus have got? It has a floor, it has a roof, it has a wall which is related to it. So if you see this, this is the roof we call, can call it, which is related to the orbit or inferior plate of the orbit which is related to it. This is having a floor which is related to the maxilla which is lying on these regions. This particular part of this particular sinus which is going into it, it makes an apex and related to the zygomatic bone and this is a related to the lateral wall of the nose or nasal cavity which is lying on these regions. And then as well, this particular sinus is holding a space, we call them a sphenoidal sinus, a uh, maxillary sinus which is lying here. Now, this particular maxillary sinus has an opening which opens into the middle meatus which is going through, going through and draining it. So this is the opening where you can see it is opening into the maxillary, uh, from the maxillary sinus into space which is known as middle meatus going through this particular region. Now the right side and the left side we have these two maxillary sinuses which is present in here. The nerve supply and the blood supply which is related to which is known as alveolar arteries which is a branch of maxillary arteries and the nerve supply which is coming from this particular maxillary nerve which is branch of V2 V2 divisions which is supplying to it. So this particular maxillary sinus, the detailed anatomy of this, sometimes we see that individually may be coming as an exam short note, which is coming uh, to describe the different parts of the maxillary sinus because this is the one of the largest and this is the one which need to be tested. Uh, apart from that, this sinuses and where do they drain, this particular orientation is important for your practical exam theory exam as well. We just like uh, give the sagittal section, ask you to, about the meters, identify the meters and conchas and what this particular meters and conchas are draining into, or what kind of sinus is draining into this particular space. So this particular chart that you have to keep in mind along with this particular opening of this nasal lacrimal duct, the tear gland which is pouring the secretions which has to keep in mind in regard to this particular drainage point. Coming to the clinicals, fractures of the nose, more, one of the commonest thing which breaks because it is a projected part of the face and this particular nose if it is broken easy to fix because this is displacement of this particular nasal bones is really really less. Now coming to this particular grave anatomy for problem related to this particular fracture, if it is a complicated fracture or it may be just like a injuring the deeper part of this particular bone breaking this cubiform plate of ethmoid. As I have mentioned, the cubiform plate of ethmoid, through that cubiform plate, plate of ethmoid, we see the olfactory nerve running through. And as well as on top of this cubiform plate of ethmoid, we have the brain and which is covered by dura mater. So, if we have the cubiform plate of ethmoid broken into this particular region, root of the nose and deep into it, we may have injuries to the dura mater. If we have this injury to the dura mater, that exposes the subarachnoid space lying deep to it. If the subarachnoid space is exposed, that means we have the CSF, 
which is also a thread. That means the subarachnoid space, if it is bridged because of the dura mater bridge, we can have a leakage of the CSA through that particular point. And if the CSA is leaking, that will be leaking through this particular nose or nasal cavity, and CSA will be coming down, trickling through this nose. So this clinical condition, we call them as CSA rhinorrhea. That means a running nose, the CSA is coming out. So this anatomy you have to mention. Whenever you have to explain that CSA rhinorrhea, explain it. You have to explain this particular roof part of this particular anatomy or roof skeleton part of the nasal cavity, which makes this cribriform plate or moist sphenoidal body, etc., etc., part of this bone, which is making here. If this particular cribriform plate or moist, which is a kind of sieve-like structure, breaks down because of the injuries, or if not injuries, if the bone itself melts down, these injuries to this dura mater leading to this particular exposure of the subarachnoid space that leads to this leakage of the CSF through the nasal cavity. And this particular phenomenon is known as CSF rhinorrhea. So this is one of the clinical explain why kind of question that may be coming up. Other thing, deviation of the nasal septum. This is made of partly cartilage, partly bony. Now the union of this bony, partly cartilage, partly partly bony, may, be, may not be a, a midline straight structure, may have a deviation. This is one of the commonest deviations what you see in a clinical life about this particular deviated nasal septum. So this is how it looks like in a, a, during this particular examination or during exposure. You see that this is a midline septum and you see that how curved it is over, over, over curvature point which is lying to it. Now, this is what we're talking about, bleeding through this particular external lobe. we call them as epistaxis. It could be anterior epistaxis, it could be posterior epistaxis, depending on how the blood is coming out. If the blood is coming out through the external nasal opening, we call them as anterior epistaxis. If it is coming from the posterior nasal opening or quena, we call them as posterior nasal opening or posterior epistaxis. Reason, we understand that this is a highly vascular mucosa. If it is having injuries in children or in adults, depending on this particular clinical point, we understand why it bleeds and what are the arteries that is making an anastomosis and reefs and arteries, which is branches of the ethmoidal, anterior posterior ethmoidal, greater palatine, lesser palatine, facial artery, labial branches, etc. Et those are things, those six branches that you have to mention coming over here, making an anastomosis, getting into it. Sinus. This particular sinus we have mentioned frontal sinus, sphenoidal sinus, ethmoidal sinus, maxillary sinus, all of them could be infected. They may be infected because of the infection, because we take this air, this particular air contains this germs, everything, this nasal mucosa may be affected. As this nasal mucosa is affected, the same expansion of the nasal mucosa, which is getting into this particular sinuses, will be infected as well. That leads to the sinus infection, we call them as sinusitis. Now this sinusitis may be acute, that means it happened right now. It may be chronic, may be running for a period of time, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, something like that. Now, if this particular sinus infection or sinusitis, which is running for a period of time, that means chronic sinusitis, we have a tender point within this particular sinus region. So, if this chronic sinusitis is there, involving this particular frontal sinus, if you press this individual, this forehead, this region where this frontal sinus is there, the patient will be complaining of tenderness. We call them a sinus tenderness. So, these are the points if we press on in a patient having chronic sinusitis, this particular point so will be painful. We call them a sinus tenderness elicit examination. So this is what you have to know, the surface marking or surface morphology about the sinus and how to press it and why, what are the interpretation out of pressing that in terms of chronic sinusitis. Maxillary sinusitis, again, coming back to the maxillary sinus. This is one of the area that you have to prepare well because this is the area where you see that number of times we see the clinical questions and as well as the anatomical question is coming. And when you are addressing this maxillary sinus, you have to mention about the clinical point. The infections of the maxillary sinus, we have to mention it as a maxillary sinus. So we have made, projected a picture of this maxillary sinus, which is present beforehand. This particular picture, which is a different picture. So this particular sinus, you see that it is marked with different colors, uh, different letters, A, B, C, D, E. So out of these, which is the maxillary sinus? Which letter? A and B. What are the, is the A and B the same or are they dissimilar? Is the A and B is similar or it's a dissimilar? Now see, you have to pass the examination. I'm talking to you guys. I'm talking to you guys. 
you have to pass the examination by smiling you cannot get your number so if you see this a and b what are the difference between a and b one is black one is gray so what normal is that we have to know then we can interpret the abnormal right now what the normal sinus is occupied with it is a line with or covered with this particular mucosa which is lining to it and inside this particular sinus we have the air filled in so how this particular air filled space looks like in a skygram it looks like black so if it is look, looking like black black is the normal thing so out of this a and b the b one is black and a one is gray that means the b one is healthy and a one is unhealthy now what this a one is known as sinusitis now this particular sinus is occupied by mucus which is coming from the sinus secretions which is lying over there that means the b side is affected so that interpretations that comes over here is the maxillary sinus of this a side that means on the right side it is marked on right side and left side so right side maxillary sinus is infected we call them as right side maxillary sinusitis whereas the left side is the healthier side so this particular interpretation is also good see rest of the sinus is like e s model a sinus frontal uh, we cannot see it pro properly which is a little high up and conoidal also we cannot see it properly so this interpretations of this particular sinuses and the maxillary sinus inflammation is very important coming to this particular olfactory nerves which is easy to understand over here that we have mentioned so this olfactory nerves comes through this olfactory mucosa which is lying in the superior part of this nasal cavity so this is the roof of the nasal cavity where this particular olfactory mucus is there within this olfactory mucus are the receptor cells of the olfactory nerves are there so this is lying hanging over there which is known as olfactory nerves which is now running like rootlets several thousands of these rootlets are hanging over there this rootlets coming over here pierces this pv form this is the magnified view form here so this is a pv form plate of ethmoid which has a pores in it this olfactory mucosa which is lying over here had tons of receptor ends from the olfactory nerves comes over here and drains into this particular yellow structure this is olfactory bulb and olfactory tract so this olfactory nerve takes the sensation from this roof region goes inside and this particular region goes or, or gets into this particular olfactory bulb olfactory tract and olfactory area in the brain takes the sensation now this is what we are talking about so if this particular pv form plate of ethmoid is damaged we have the overlying brain which is covered by this particular csf Uh, which is which is covered by the meninges holding the csf will be exposed and resulting in leakage of the csf through this pv form plate and once it pierces through the pv form plate it trickles down to this nasal cavity to this exterior of nose we call them a csf rhinorrhea at the same time if you have a breakage of this pv form plate these olfactory nerves which are running through will be also trapped and as a result of that injury to these olfactory nerves will be there so this particular person may have the smell error that means anosmia or partial or complete that means perception of the smell may be partially or completely may be damaged if you have this pv form plate damage as well along with csf rhinorrhea that is another concern related to this part now coming back to this thing olfactory nerve coming from this olfactory mucosa runs through the pv form plate enters to the olfactory bulb and then to the cranial cavity which is related to it then forms a tract and goes to this goes to the area of the brain which is known as olfactory region how we're going to test it we close the patient's eye and just like a give a family a sense smell to smell it out closing one nose till at a time close one right side nose till ask to smell if you can smell anything can tell the name of the smell if it is okay or if you can smell yes or no that is the first thing that you can just like a note it down if it is smelling or okay, you find you may not be able to identify the nature of the smell but if it is smelling something then it is working do the same thing to the opposite side give some smell to the opposite side ask came to sniff sniff and if you can sniff it or any smell or not that's the way we test this particular olfactory nerve testing now it may be just so i'm saying loss of the smell we call them as anosmia partial that means partially loss of smell is there complete that means complete anosmia complete or partial loss of smell will be there so based on these particular regions we test this particular smell session and how this particular olfactory bulb looks like the entry interior of the skull that means you are looking into this 
region of this brain, we call them as base of the brain. This part, we call them as olfactory area or olfactory surface, and this is known as tentorial surface. Within this, you see this particular olfactory bulb and this olfactory tract, which is going down to this particular olfactory area on these particular areas of the brain. So this is how this particular olfactory tract, olfactory nerve, olfactory bulbs, anosmia, testing of these things comes over here. So to summarize, we have to know about this particular nose, nasal cavity, boundaries, roofs, etc., etc. We have to know this particular about the nasal skeleton, which is making the septum. We have to know about the mucosa. We have to know about the blood supply of this interior of these regions of this nasal mucosa and why it is vascularity leading to this particular bleeding fluid. We call them as epistaxis in children and this adult. This epistaxis varies. And why do they vary? And what are these things present over there? And then we go to this particular uh, paranasal sinuses. What are the paranasal sinuses? Where do they drain? And what this particular drainage point need, leads to us out of this paranasal sinuses, uh, which is the largest one, the clinical anatomy leads to the largest one, which is the sinusitis, etc., etc. That we have to know. And along with that, the second cranial nerve, olfactory. How this olfactory nerve related to this particular cubiform plate? What's the effect of this particular damage to the cubiform plate in terms of explaining CSF rhinorrhea, in terms of explaining this uh, anosmia, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and how to taste this CSF, uh, how to smell this smell taste or sniff taste, and do it clinically. I think uh, you have to come roll number one to roll number fifty. Okay. I mean, I have at least. Up to 40 presentations are made, isn't it? Well, what is your own feedback about your own presentation? So just tell me. What is your own feedback about your own presentation? I do not cross off. See, yesterday we thought that I will talk to you and I will say that, sir, we all three will start gossiping and talking to each other without listening. Now, how one will feel? I mean, I think none of you talk to each other. None of you has considered on the mobile. But everybody heard how, what your colleague or your classmate is speaking. See, somebody is speaking and somebody is making noise in front of. It will cause too much disturbance to the speaker. It will draw at the attention. And that's what exactly happened to us. See, if you don't like any class, I would suggest that in future, make it a point that those who want to hear, come to the first page, to the page, so that you can see it. And those who do not want, first and foremost, do not use mobile. You can say this is a crime during class. And talk, I mean, very silently if you want to talk. That is also not allowed. But if you want that your attendance will be required, for that purpose, I think attending class will not be required. You can do some homework also, whatever you like on the class. But don't disturb the class in future for anybody. Because everybody wants that the speaker, what he is telling, the audience will listen. That's the decorum of the class. And then only you will interact. I think at least I will, I'll, it's my own comment. But I'm quite happy uh, to see uh, your presentation. All of you, whatever way you have done, you have done very good job. Everybody has done excellently. Of course, again, if you want to compare, if you want to make an examination, there's a first, second, third. That's a rule. You cannot escape from that. But that doesn't mean that one speaker who is speaking very well and who cannot speak today will not be able to speak better the, than him tomorrow or her. Okay? So that's the rule. You go on improving. So uh, yesterday and day before yesterday, I told one thing to all of you. Well, I mean, the, all the batches. The same thing I'm repeating here. Write one thing. And you please write the same word. Of wherever, you, wherever you will be opening a register. All of you are having a potential. I do. I don't have any doubt about it. But it doesn't mean that you have to excel in medical sciences only. There will be other uh, sides of your talent. So first write, write 
unless u l l e a s h write it unless uh, be it theoretical be it practical bring a copy at this register with you so that you make a note and make a record an activity whatever you have done because retrospectively we have to see what you have done in the past day to day activity and i can tell you after joining my service almost i used to make it a daily record log book what i have done on that day and in the every evening i used to introspect myself what i have not done all these days have passed what i have not done and all important points all important reports whatever i have got in my life are with me and that i make presentations wherever i go these are invaluable documents to me with your patient reports these are abnormal reports which i personally have encountered a same thing you will definitely experience and make a record of it that's how medical science progresses so unless number one unless your your means it is your means my in your case my untapped u n t a p p e d potential p o t e n t i a l s unless your untapped potentials tar niche ekta sentence lekho same sentence tai lekho shudhu ekta word add korte hobe lekho abar unless your untapped potential oi unless your hitato h i t h e r t o eta ke ekta arrow diye upore lekho एटी मान बोझार चेस्ट कर नट बी एबल टू अंडारस्टैंड डू कम आई एक्सप्लेन नट नाउ दिस आई एम गिविंग इट टू यू आई टी आनलिस योर हिटार टू आनटप पोटेंशियल आनलिस योर ओखने सेकेंड लाइन में लेको क्या प्रथम पार्टा सैटिस्फाइड है एट वन पॉइंट अफ टाइम बाट दैट सेकेंड पॉइंट उल नेभार एंडिंग इन योर लाइफ you have to continuously improve so long you remain alive and that line will be applicable for that okay so uh with this very brief introduction let me uh, start uh, today's discussion that is csf have you been ever told about csf in anatomy or physiology class ha huh? bolo bolo ha huh? ki bolo ग्रामे धान जमीन पास আর বাংলা মিডিয়াম আমার শিখানো বাংলা মিডিয়ামে যথেষ্ট ভালো পড়ানো হয় ইংলিশ জানলে আমি ইংলিশ মিডিয়ামের লোকের চেয়ে ভালো জানি এটা তোমাকে আমি বলে দিচ্ছি আমাদের এত বড় হাসপাতাল ছিল তো স্যার আমাদের হাসপাতালে কম ডাক্তার ছিল 180 ডাক্তার সবচেয়ে ভালো ইংলিশ আমি জানি আমি আজও বলে দিচ্ছি তো এই ইংলিশ যদি বাংলা মিডিয়ামে পড়ে যাও ইংলিশ জানবে না এটা হতে পারে না কোন একদম ভুল ধারণা তোমাকে আমি বলে দিচ্ছি একদম ভুল ধারণা আমি তোমাকে বলে দিচ্ছি এখনো বলছি मीडियम আমি এখনো জোর করে বলতে পারি ঠিক আছে তো ইংলিশ জাস্ট এ মিডিয়াম উই আর ট্রান্সলেটিং फ्रॉम বেঙ্গলি টু ইংলিশ নট দ্যাটস অল নাথিং গ্রেট নাথিং গ্রেট সো জাস্ট সি ইউ হ্যাভ নট বিন টোল্ড এনি এনি আইডিয়া अबाउट সিএসএফ এনি আইডিয়া বিকজ ইউ সি দিস ইজ এ অ্যাকচুয়ালি অ্যাপ্লাইড অ্যাসপেক্ট ইফ ইউ ডোন্ট নো দা বেসিক ইট উইল বি ভেরি ডিফিকাল্ট টু আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড দা ক্লিনিক্যাল ইমপ্লিকেশন অফ what csf is because you have to do at the at the end 
the testing part. So you have to know the background, otherwise you will not be able to understand properly. That's the problem. So keeping that in mind, basically my basic part will be basically biochemical parameters and interpretation and to be very frank, to be honest, it will take only 5 minutes time to cover this topic. Provided you know the entire thing. But since you don't know, I'll, today I'll, very, uh, uh, I'll uh, discuss very briefly so that I'll cover some amount of anatomy, some amount of physiology. And today at least, after going from the class, today I finished reading CSF. Then you will remember. And at the end of the lecture, like other classes, like LFT or thyroid function test or diabetes, what I did? At the end, I wanted to know whether the LFT class, whether you can diagnose hepatocellular jaundice, obstructive jaundice or hemolytic jaundice. Similarly, in thyroid, hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. In diabetes, whether it is normal, whether it is impaired or whether it is a diabetes. Same thing will be applicable here. The three common things which you will see in your day to day clinical practice, particularly those who will be practicing medicine and general practice, they will be encountering meningitis cases. So there are three common types of meningitis one is viral, one is bacterial, and a third one is tuberculosis. And you have to differentiate between the three, among the three basically. So today, at least I will say, by seeing at least the CSF, you will be able to diagnose. If you cannot diagnose where you are in a doubt, even if you do two tests of biochemistry, you will be able to diagnose properly and correctly what a tuberculosis meningitis, what is a viral meningitis and what is a bacterial meningitis. In addition, where if there is any requirement, you can look at the hematological features also. Uh, that will be indicative. In isolation, I am telling you, if you are very much, I mean, well versed about the subject, without seeing the patient by seeing the report, you will be able to diagnose. And today, at the end of the class, each one of you have to diagnose based on the report itself whether you are handling a case of any one of the three meningitis. If you cannot do it, the entire purpose of the class will be lost. And I am the most disheartened person. And today I think it is the last class of me for your session. So if you have any doubt, you can interact whatever classes I have taken on the way here and there in the campus. See, basically the salient features, try to remember all these things, do not talk, please switch off your mobile. If you, do, if you, if you switch on, if I have see, if I see anybody talking, please I will simply stop and simply go out of the class today. Because uh, today is Saturday, I want to finish it a little early also. So, CSCB is present in the subarachnoid space. What is the space between the arachnoid space and the dura fire matter? Because meninges is... Uh, Composed of three layers. One is dura, one is arachnoid, and another is pia. So it's a subarachnoid space means between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter. And in the ventricle system, we are having two lateral ventricles on either side, and third ventricle in the middle and the fourth ventricle down below. So it is present in the subarachnoid space, ventricular system, inside and around the brain because it makes a fluid covering over the entire central nervous system beat cerebral hemisphere, beat spinal cord. And CSF production is just like human formation, it is an ultrafiltrate of plasma. Now, what is an ultrafiltration? It is a membrane bound filtration process by which the high molecular weight proteins are, weight uh, substances are retained while the low molecular weight proteins are allowed to pass through. And whether it is a urine, whether it is CSF, whether it is peritoneal fluid, pleural fluid or pericardial fluid, all are essentially basically ultrafiltrate of plasma. In addition, the purpose of different fluids are different. Urine, we are passing it out, it is an excreted product. So, do not expect that the composition of urine will be the same as a CSF. So, CSF is having a different purpose because there is no lymphatic system in the central nervous system, the only drainage system is CSF of the waste product of the central nervous system is venous system and the 
CSS. And again, if you recall the pericardial fluid, brain is basically pumping. So it requires a, a lubricant around it. Lung is expanding. So lungs also require some amount of lubricating substances. And in the peritoneum also, peritoneum moves, there are several structures that are interested in moving. So some amount of lubrications are required. So these are added. So that are basically called transudate, not alpha filtrate. But the essential production is through ultra filtration, the main fluid on top of which these are added as a lubricating substances. But no such lubricating substance is present in CSR, neither in the urine. That's the difference. So CSA production will be by the choroid plexus. Choroid plexus is a tuft of vessels, just like globulus, and it is located within the lateral ventricles. And daily, we are having a production of 750 ml at the rate of almost 0.5 ml per minute. But the total CSA of any, any individual uh, remains fixed. It is around 125 to 150. The brain size of every person is not the same. Therefore, the CSF will not have a fixed volume. But there will be a biological variation. And that variation ranges from 150 to 250, 200, uh, 125 to 150. It's a very narrow range. Obviously, you do not expect that the volume of CSF will be the same as that of a neonate or a child. That amount will be less. Isn't it? So, this is an adult picture. So, CSA flow basically it flows over the surface of the brain and the entire length of the spinal cord. So, daily production is 750, but it is maintaining 125. So, that means there is a continuous production of CSF and there is a continuous draining system. So, CSF turnover is rate is very high almost. It's five times more than five times. Okay. So, daily we are producing, every minute we are producing, we are also taking out some amount of CSF, now how the CSF is coming out from the cerebral space, that you must remember. See, you remember this part, this part of come as an anatomy class, this part can come as a physiology, it can come as back history also, how cerebral, cerebral spinal fluid flows. It is produced in the lateral ventricle through the choroid plexus, remember, that you must remember, that is the site of production. And if you recall the structure, have you not been covered brain in the anatomy class? Have you been covered cerebrum? So, have you heard about lateral ventricle? So, lateral ventricle from lateral ventricle to the third ventricle, the opening is foramen of Monroe on either side. So, through the foramen of Monroe, it comes to third ventricle. From third ventricle uh, through cerebral aqueduct or aqueduct of Sylvia, it comes to fourth ventricle. From fourth ventricle, remember there are three openings. One is for about the Magendi. Magendi, try to remember M means transfer in the middle. So that will be an easier to remember. And on either side, there is a Laska, for of Laska. So it is placed laterally on both sides. And through for of these openings, the actually cerebral solid fluid passes through into the subarachnoid space. Now that fluid, if you recall, the, these through the foramen of Magenti, which one is passing, is filling the entire spinal cord. And through the foramen of Laska, it is covering the surface of the brain, a cerebral cortex. And once this is formed, uh, this, from southern space, this spinal cord is basically drained into the system, in the venous system, through the arachnoid villi or arachnoid granulations. Uh, these are basically Outputting of arachnoid granulation, uh, 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 this uh, arachnoid matter. And that is basically the uh, root of how the CSF uh, gets absorbed. I, I can show you this picture, you remember. This is basically the arachnoid granulation. Okay. So from there through superior sagittal sinus, so this is the site and this is the superior sagittal sinus through which it drains. You see, if you, but this flow will be possible only if there is a valve-like system. Uh, there is not a true valve at the sub uh, granulation, but there is a valve-like mechanism so that it allows only one-way flow. Otherwise, blood will enter into the 
subordinate space. The pressure in the subordinate space of the cerebral spinal fluid is high so that the fluid flows from cerebral spinal fluid to venous system. Okay. So the clinically most important part is that this space, in this space, you just write down this thing very clearly. I will repeat it once more. In the subordinate space, CSF comes in contact with perivascular spaces around the blood vessel. And actually in meningitis, inflammation occurs here. And because of the inflammation, uh, leaking occurs of the cells and the proteins from that side. Okay. So that side it enters the cells and the protein membranes into the cerebrospinal fluid. And based on its composition, again I repeat, you will be able to diagnose these three cases. So this is, I have uh, said, this will be told in detail about you know, in, uh, in your anatomy class, just to cover you, uh, uh, this cover the matter of where the arachnoid gland is located, uh, where the superior sagittal sinus is there. Uh, this is a histological structure, this is most simplified structure. Histologically, definitely you can see this video I will show you. See, one MRI picture I have, uh, this is a live MRI picture, you could have seen that brain is putting literally inside the, inside the, I mean, uh, outside the brain. So, just look at the picture. The, it is formed in the lateral ventricle, uh, flowing through the third ventricle, fourth ventricle, and through the spinal cord it is going, and Again, it is coming, it is back, it is filling the covering part of the both the whiskers and through which this arachnoid granulation the, it is being, I mean, yeah, the the Okay. Have you seen this thing? So it will be clear? Should I show the video once again? Okay. Hold it. See, this is found in the lateral ventricle. Clear? Uh, it is coming to the third ventricle. Okay. It is coming to the fourth ventricle. Okay. Now, one part is going down. That is spinal cord. And the rest, this is the problem of managing the uh, through problem of Laska. You see. Uh, this is coming through. I uh, see this covering. Sides are covering. And uh, this is superior. This is iron granulation. Iron granulation. And this is superior sagittal sinus. Is this part clear? Now you must not be able to solve it. So there is a there is a functional MRI picture which is not I mean opening here. So as I told you earlier uh, that this CSF volume is almost about 125 to 150 well, at any point of time in any individual, but there will be a distribution. See, it is formed in the it is most common in the cranial subordinate space because it is acting as a fluid cover over the brain to protect from injury apart from the bony structure that is the skull which we are having. It is making as a buffer which I will discuss. And in the subordinate spinal space, this is only 25 volts because that is a relatively of a uh, uh, lower uh, dimension. And lateral ventricles where it is produced, you can see the volume is 25 to 30 ml. And third ventricular size and fourth ventricular size is very small compared to the lateral ventricle. So their volumes are also, CSF volumes are also less. So these functions, these five functions you must remember throughout your life. One is buoyancy. It is brain is basically re remaining suspended within the subarmor space and is maintaining its buoyancy. See, suppose if you are a protection from injury, suppose somebody gets a hit on the brain, and all of you, I think all of you have fallen somewhere. Uh, other, 
but all of us have never sustained any head injury why because of the mechanical support of the skull number 1 number 2 if there is any movement of the brain the subordinate space subordinate fluid also moves simultaneously so brain will not be allowed to be hit on the other side on the skull a sudden shifting of the subordinate space also subordinate fluid also okay so it is acting as a shock absorber third but if the impact is very severe bone will also be damaged the subordinate protection uh, layer will also not be able to protect and it will sustain definitely a, a cerebral injury or a brain injury anywhere in the uh, area number 3 is prevents of brain ischemia and number 4 is homeostatic regulation and number 5 as i told you there is no lymphatic system so removal of waste product there are five functions of cerebrospinal fluid that you might be told in the in your physiology class now huh chale jao if you want to go home early why do you come to class then this part is this main part you are not hearing so the purpose of coming to the class is totally lost anyway you can go this there is not a jail that will be kept in custody anybody who is like to wants to go please you can go out no 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 issue but at the end those who will be presenting they will be able to diagnose this case see since it is an ultra filtrate as i told you just look at these two two points first and foremost lipid and bilirubin is conspicuously absent as you see in the urine also there is no lipid the but bilirubin is present during jaundice only that part of part is totally different in csf also in brain also bilirubin enters but that is in the pathological condition that i told you congenital hyperbilirubinemia in that condition definitely it appears but there is a higher concern normal it is not present i am talking about normal normal thing so here the protein is 7 g per deciliter means 7000 in contrast the lumbar region you remember this lumbar region forget about the ventricle and system uh, it is 15 to 45 mg so why i have chosen 7 because the normal total protein value is 6 to 8 okay so this is that's why i have taken 7 for your own uh, understanding so if i take a middle of it the 15 to 45 if i take 35 as the normal value of csf protein then if you divide that 7000 by 35 will get 200 so serum protein is the csf protein ratio is 200 into 1 why why is this uh, different because it will not allow the high molecular weight protein only small molecular weight protein can come out and albumin can come out because albumin has having a molecular weight of 67000 but higher molecular weight will not be able to come out igg that is hemoglobin that the smallest size the molecular weight is 150 and if you take a dimer of igg that is basically iga there is a joining chain at least you will get more than 3 lakh because 150 150 and there will be joining chain if you take uh, igm that's the pentamer that is 5 into 150 750 in addition there is a j chain so that's a high molecular weight protein these will be definitely present these might be present if the permeability is very high or if globulin is synthesized i mean and this is i mean at cerebrospinal uh, uh, fluid itself and it is thrown in some immunological diseases but that is a rare thing see serum csf serum ag ratio what is the serum ag ratio 1 to 1.5 is to 1 if you remember very correctly that albumin level in the blood is higher than globulin so that's why the ratio is 1.1 to 1.5 into 1 but here you see the difference serum protein to csf protein it is 200 into 1 because this is an ultra filtrate and similarly say same thing is true for globulin also see globulin is present also it is not that it is not present it is present this is 3.6 that is 3600 mg and this is 0.0155 g now if you convert it to 
15 only. Isn't it? You multiply it by 1000. Because this is, this is basically 3.6 by 3600. Gram, why I have seen? Because we express ceram in gram. And we express the CSF volume in milligram. There is 1000 times less. That you must remember. Out of this, all parameters you see, if you look at the blood glucose level and CSF glucose, it is almost 60% of what the blood glucose level, level is. Usually, blood glucose and CSF glucose does not uh, occur simultaneously. It takes about 30 minutes to 4, 5, 6 hours to equilibrate. So, at any given point of time, since many of us are diabetic, their blood sugar will be, blood glucose level will be high. So, do not expect that everybody will be having this range. Those blood sugar, whose blood sugar is 200 to 250, or 300. Do you think that CSF will be 45 to 50? No. That will be high. That will also be high. That you must remember. Because nowadays we are having a good number of diabetic patients. And they can also suffer from meningitis at one course of time, particularly after sustaining any head disease. So, their CSF analysis, while well, you must be very much careful. Now, you have to collect also simultaneously a blood sample and it should be more than less than 0 0.6 per, per <coughs> ratio because it is you, that that part you must remember but if there is an abnormal low, low lowering of glucose black and white it indicates the bacterial uh, uh, which i will discuss if you look at sodium it is slightly higher if you look at magnesium, it is higher. If you single item, if it is asked in your examination, which parameter is higher in CSF concentration, at least you must tell chloride first. And then you tell magnesium. Lower side, bicarbonate is a little bit lower. And similarly, sodium is a little bit higher. But as a whole, you try to remember all the parameters are lower than plasma, except only Right, because there is a maintenance of balance, ionic balance. Everything is low on one side, everything will be uh, high on one side. That is, donor and membrane equilibrium will not tolerate that thing. So, equilibrium has to be maintained, and for that, some negative ions are high here. So, so where from you will collect the blood? From any individual? Where from you will collect the blood? From? Huh? Media? Median cubital vein. Okay, okay, from hands we are all collect. If the hand is not available, we can collect from here. So peripheral veins, normal root. So from a child, from a baby, newborn baby, that will not, not be sufficient. Fingertip, yes, for common parameter, definitely for glucometer it can be used. For um, if we require much more investigation, that will not be sufficient. But where from we will get it? Any idea? Any idea where from you will get from a baby blood? Finger prick, if you make a finger prick, how many drops you will get? That will not be sufficient. At least we will be requiring one ml minimum, one ml of blood for any investigation. And uh, I am telling you, in the newborn baby, the fat cell volume is very high. Almost 70-80%, at times 85%. You will hardly get any plasma. So, from where you will get the blood for a baby? That needs to be investigated. You have got it out. You want to do the investigation. Only glucometer is not sufficient. Where we will collect? Any idea? You just tell something. I'll, uh, I want to have an interaction. It's a group discussion type of thing. That's why we have been divided. You just have tell some wrong things. I'll, I'll rectify. Huh? Huh? This is what will happen. See, from brain, you will puncture the brain. Blood, yeah, blood, no, blood, no. Heart, 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 হাড়ে 
আর বাচ্চারা একদম পুরো লাইফ বেবি আমি দেখলাম পরিষ্কার বাচ্চারা রয়েছে একদম পরিষ্কার জানতো কট ক্ল্যাম্প করলাম বেবিটাকে টানলাম ব্যাস বেবিটা ডেড মাকে দেখলাম বাচ্চা বাচ্চা কিন্তু কাঁদছে না টেরিফিক সিচুয়েশন ওনলি থিং ইন আই হ্যাড অ্যান আইডিয়া ইন ফিজিওলজি ক্লাস দ্যাট এপিনেফিন ক্যান বি গিভেন এপিনেফিন ইজ গিভেন ইন দ্য হার্ট হোয়াট আই ডিড ইমিডিয়েটলি আই টুক দ্য বেবি টু আস্ক আর সিস্টার সিস্টার ইউ প্লিজ টেক দ্য বেবি টু প্লিজ রাস্ট সিম্পলি ইউজ ইয়ার সাকার and i drew one ml of ad- adrenal injection and gave it directly in record in record it they simply punctured at the pericardial site and drew the blood and injected it and heart started beating baby was at least alive only problem is what i could not understand that i perhaps could made some amount of damage baby was alive no doubt but there is a time lag <laughs> see no no see no no clapping there will be abnormal situations which you will face in your life at that time you have to use your own brain see giving a dead body to a mother is a painful condition i am telling you when a baby has been born as a fully alive term baby cord round the neck and it caused asphyxia during delivery and i have conducted it after clamping it the baby was not crying during my intensive it happened nobody was around no senior person was there So I used my physiology class, physiology knowledge, and gave an intracardiac injection of one ml only. Heart started pumping. The respiration was restored. During that time, in 1986, there was no such type of advanced facility was there. But at least I am happy that I could give a mother a live baby. It's a very pathetic condition if you deliver a baby and give a dead baby to a. That's what I am telling. Every biochemistry knowledge, every knowledge, whatever you are having here. not only for this csf class but again i am telling you there is a severe uh, uh, ascites in one patient and uh, there is it is not written in the medicine book that this type of therapy is given that i told my sister that a sister you give albumin level was so low and because of that the fluid was accumulated in the abdomen i told her that your doc brother might be an, i mean basically physician he will not allow this in the a uh, uh, this procedure but i am suggesting that procedure what is written in the book it will be taking 6 months time for the ascites to go but if i ask you uh, tell you the method your this entire fluid will go in 3 days time and your mother will walk in one week's time what i did albumin level was low i told him that transfuse you human serum albumin that Three bottles of human trans, uh, albumin, trans, uh, albumin was given. You know where from I got the knowledge? I knew the knowledge because of biochemistry, and that I applied on the patient. So therefore, whatever classes you are taking, and in three days' time with three bottles, the entire fluid in the collected in the uh, peritoneum fluid simply passed away through the urine. That's the purpose I am telling you. See, so everything is important. Whatever you are learning. try to make an application wherever you will get a chance so collection of csf uh, this is i am telling you this from the baby see there is no root but to take a lumbar puncture see from the femoral vein now can anybody tell whether where the femoral vein is located whether it is medial lateral inferior or superior to femoral artery because you have to ultimately locate it where it is located it is superior to the femoral artery or inferior or medial or lateral lateral and that you must be able to tell at this stage that's that is what i want to, i want also express you have been told about inferior uh, extremity have you not been told about the anterior triangle what are the structures under the if i i am not asking the anatomy question i am asking a very simple question where the femoral vein is located Fibular artery, yes. Fibular artery, laterally. Fib- la- lateral to fibular artery or lateral to medial? Conta, conta, lateral area. Artery lateral, lateral area. Fibular vena. Or, I mean, just because the fibular fibular vena, what is it? Fibular artery, then fibular vena. Fibular artery, then medial area, then lateral area, then medial area. How about you? Did you get it? মিডিয়ালি ফিবল ভেন মিডিয়ালি আছে 
তাহলে ফিমোল ফ্যানটা ট্যাপ করবে কি করে ফিমোল লাটারিটা পল সেট করবে এখানে ঠিক একদম ফিমোল ফ্যানটাকে ইয়ে করলে পল সেট করলে এখানে এইবারে আঙুলটা যেটা রয়েছে আঙুলটার পাশ দিয়ে পুরো নিডলটাকে পাংচার করবে নিয়ে একটু টানবে তার নেগেটিভ সাকশন দেবে তাহলে ফিমোল ভ্যান থেকে ব্লাডটা পেয়ে যাবে তো ইফ ইউ ওয়ান্ট টু কালেক্ট এ লার্জার স্যাম্পল অফ ব্লাড সিস্টার্স আর উইল নট ডু ইট আনটিল অ্যানালাইস এক্সপার্ট বাট অ্যাজ এ ডক্টর ইউ হ্যাভ টু ডু ইট so that you must know that total full anatomy of that particular place and you must be able to puncture only get only a single chance you cannot puncture doubly to a baby particularly newborn remember that's a very dangerous procedure and accidentally if you prick femoral artery that will cause catastrophic results i'm telling you that was total i mean hematoma but anyway that's not the um, uh, i mean class for femoral artery tapping so how will you collect Uh, that I, I saw in the picture. I mean, why lumbar function? Huh? L4, L3, L4. Why from L3, L4? Yes, correctly, correctly told. L1, final cord surgery, lower border stress is set, check. L3, L4, you can detect, how do you detect L3, L4? Huh? ইন্টারাল and that is the identification point for lc l4 why because spinal cord is ending at the lower end of the l1 vertebra so we have to leave one space below because if by chance uh, the spinal cord ends somewhere down below uh, there is a high chance that you are likely to puncture that suburban uh, spinal cord to avoid that thing as you choose l3 l4 the most uh, preferred place and from where it is uh, collected L4 L5 also you can collect but that you may not get a, uh, that uh, adequate amount of fluid the common space is uh, here only thing remember it is just like a surgery it's all aseptic precautions have to be taken because if if you do not take it if the patient is not infected through needle you will in, uh, introduce infection in the spinal cord and that will cause meningitis remember so therefore we very particular about aseptic precautions not only with a normal needle but you require a lumbar puncture needle that is a special needle that is sterilized all materials are sterilized by inserting between the interspinous space lc and l4 vertebra of course for baby will be size will be different for uh, young child the size will be different for adult this is a special size and these are available and we draw if you puncture it here and the csf is not in normal pressure then it will come and drop away remember one thing before doing any lumbar puncture you have to ensure there is no intracranial tension because if there is a high intracranial tension and if you puncture it so it will come in jet and there will sudden fall in the uh, pressure a uh, cerebral spinal special pressure that that will cause hardening of the brain and you might lose the patient during this procedure that you must ensure so if you once you puncture it will come drop wise there is a possibility that during this puncture there is an accidental peak in there because you you are doing it in blindly once you do this thing at least first time you will remember that this needle will go very smoothly i mean through a hard structure through the ligament will pass then at one point of time will feel the cartilage it will hit a, a, a you will get a good amount of resistance once you puncture that thing it will give away and the the needle will go inside the spinal space uh, subarachnoid space and from the the moment it goes you can see from uh, the other side this coming drop wise and you have to collect in three samples three vacuums one will go for diagnostic one will go for pathology and one will go for bacteriology by chance particularly for babies you cannot draw six samples of uh, csf no not permitted because the volume is so low in that case if you draw even if you draw three molar blood 
please inform the laboratory that we could not draw more than this, this is a baby. So they will try to do this analysis with the, that amount of blood. Okay. And while you are tapping, you will be able to diagnose the case what it is. That's what that's the purpose of the student's class. So what, what will happen after you do the lumbar puncture, since you are drawing 6 ml of blood out of 125 ml, so there will be sudden reduction in the pressure and that will cause post lumbar puncture headache. That's why as a routine, the patients are allowed to lie down at least for 4 to 6 hours because CSF will be formed at the rate of 0.5 ml per hour. So to replenish that, it will take about if you give, allow them to at least uh, uh, quietly uh, lie down on the bed, at least 3-4 ml CSF will be formed by that time. Remember, CSF is a very infectious material. You have to handle it carefully. You don't know what type of infection it is. So, indications for lumbar puncture are mainly meningitis. And in fact, I am telling you in Borsman Medical College, there is a basically uh, encephalitis ward during the outbreak post release season. And I have done almost uh, 100 of cases of LPA during my internship period. So, every case needs to be ruled out whether it is an encephalitis or meningitis. And that's the, that was the basic purpose. So, we have done a number of LPs and you need practice, otherwise you will be dry tap. You will not be able to insert the needle, you will always you'll not get the fluid. So, that requires practice. So, whenever you will find an opportunity, do an LP yourself. So, basically the purpose is viral, bacterial and tubercular. And in resource poor setting, you will not get a CT facility. Now, today, because of the advent of the CT specialty, you can diagnose whether there is an intracranial hemorrhage or not. But in a resource poor setting, even if you do work in a hospital, there are no, 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 not two CT scans. Maybe you will get one CT scan, they will like something will be required. It might go out of order. Patient is admitted. What will you do? And you suspect that is the case of Sadagran hemorrhage. And you have to confirm it. So, for that, you require a LP. And a characteristic finding will be found in Sadagran hemorrhage, which I will show it to you. Uh, brain tumors, of course, can be diagnosed today by CT scan or MRI, better MRI. But again, for some tumors, you will be requiring so what type it is, what was the actual cause, particularly for immunological infection and other CNS infections, particularly Gulenberry syndrome. Gulenberry syndrome cannot be diagnosed radiologically. I am telling you, it needs to be diagnosed by biochemical confirmation. Clinically, you can suspect you will have a good suspicion, there will be paraplegia, both legs will not be moving. In fact, I, I have seen a one case during my internship again, one lady, I will sustain the Glenberry system, she both legs were paralyzed, the husband was not willing to take her back. It's a very pathetic condition. So, again, I repeat the same thing, you re remember this thing, this line if you want to like uh, down also. See, say, comes in contact with the perivascular space around the blood vessels entering and leaving the brain from where cells and protein leak during inflammation. Or if there is an obstruction to the CSF flow, that brain tumors and other neurological diseases. And in CSF, albumin is a predominant protein. The globulin is also present but in the less high concentration. If there is a marked increase in the permeability, Particularly for chronic diseases, tuberculosis. It doesn't occur in a overnight, unlike bacterial or viral and meningitis. So that causes progressive damage to the, uh, I mean, uh, that meninges. And it increases the permeability. That's why fibrin regenerated molecular weight of 350 kilo dalton also comes through and the fibrin makes a clot. A characteristic clot for tuberculosis. And you will be able to diagnose if you keep the fluid overnight, about 12 hours. That picture I will show you also to you. So, as I told you earlier, usually 2 ml is collected in each 3 tubes. One is sent for biochemical, glucose and protein. One is cytological for cell count and cell type. And third one is bacteriological. Because if you want to see the bacteria, presence of bacteria, whether it is a bacterial, pure bacteria or a mycobacteria. Okay. For that, we have to identify the bacteria uh, through microscopy. And culture sensitivity will be required because you have to choose the proper antibiotics. Once you diagnose, you start empirical treatment on meningitis. Whatever be an antibiotic available. In our days, penicillin was available. Penicillin. Now, today, we are not using penicillin. Septraxone is used. You start septraxone and then you wait for the culture sensitivity report. Then you select the proper antibiotic. That's the purpose. 
So biochemical investigation, and remember this is a priority investigation, just like hypoglycemia. If you doubt, suspect any hypoglycemia, you can do it glucometer, or if you want to reconfirm it, send it to the laboratory under investigation, under request. So the laboratory will take the sample out of turn and make it and uh, make it as a first sample to be analyzed. So CSF sample has to be done on priority. Because you require a diagnosis immediate. And secondly, blood glu CSF glucose level will fall if you allow it. Because bacteria will be there, the neutrophils will be there, and they will consume the entire glucose. Whatever is present, small amount of glucose, and it will bring down to zero also. So there will be erroneous interpretation also if you don't do it on priority basis. So simply call, inform the laboratory. And since you will be doing the biochemical investigation, the sample has to be sent to you first because it will contain cells. So the cells needs to be deposited. And if there is a clot also, that clot needs to be deposited. We want a clear fluid for analysis. So CSF analysis, glucose is done. That is the GOD fluid method which you are doing for the blood glucose level. Because you see the sensitivity blood glucose level you have seen. What is the range? 40 to 50. So that will be present as for normal age ratio, as I told you, it is 3 to 1 and serum procedure is 1 to 1. And protein estimation is done by the sulfur salicylic acid method. Just remember this thing, this is the cheapest method, even today we are, the SQS, we are doing the same procedure. Of course, sulfur salicylic acid, uh, there is a kit method also available that is being done everywhere, wherever you go. Even in this hospital, perhaps this uh, kit method is used. There is a uniqueness of the kit method. It is simple that pyrogonal uh, red is there. Uh, this method, sulfosalic acid, is just like protein, urine, urine protein. You add, uh, if there is a protein, if you add sulfosalic acid, it will cause turbidity. Same thing will be true for CSF. So it will cause the turbidity and you measure the turbidity in a colorimetry. Uh, this CSF protein is a pyrogonal red. That forms Basically, a colored complex with the CSF protein and the absorbance is proportional to the concentration of that protein. That's the simplest thing. And you can see the uh, protocol I am telling you. In, 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 in your, so far, in your experiments, you have used one standard. But if you want to have a sulfur acid, you require a multiple standard, a multi standard curve. So it ranges from 12.5 to 100, from basically from 0 to 100 milligram per deciliter. Now you analyze the sample and you get a result somewhere here. You plot this result like this. You will get, you will get the reading here. This is a very stable curve. 30 years back, 31 years back when I joined this curve was drawn and I cross-checked into the human serum albumin. This, uh, this uh, results are very stable. So we are using the same standard curve. So that is the simplest thing. The only limitation here, you can cover only up to 100. And if sample is higher than that one, that requires to be diluted and it has to be multiplied. Like I modified the technique because the CSF sample is a little very precious, you cannot get it twice. So I have, in the initial phase at least, I have diluted the sample. So I will get at least up to 200 milligrams. So because we multiply it by two. This is the modification which I made after joining. Again, the parallel method, the same procedure, you make a reagent of one ml. You add this water in blank, standard 20 ml, the sample 20 ml, and allow the just the last like glucose procedure, wait for 10 minutes, uh, take OD reading at 600 nanometers, total concentration, OD test, OD standard in the concentration standard. The linearity here is most important part is 20 to 3000. That is the main difference between sample salicylic acid and this one. The only thing is that every time you need to do a, this test repeating, not only you cannot do a single curve using that curve, that's, a, that's a another point. But usually with that figure up to 200, we can diagnose most of the cases. The test for globulin, this is just to remember the name, Pandis test. For globulin, in future, if you require any globulin to be analyzed, you ask for Pandis test. It is just an addition of federal and water, and two drops of CSF you give degree of population, just like turbidity. And marked copulations, remember, marked copulations, this is done only in case of multiple sclerosis. Now, this type of cases is not found nowadays, not done that much nowadays. It's usually done in the neurological setup. Now, come to the main point where you have to concentrate absolutely, because at the end you have to answer this question. See, normal appearance, clear, transparent, and colorless. Normal appearance will also be found in viral meningitis. Turbid appearance will be a characteristic feature for 
bacterial infection, bacterial meningitis. And cobweb cobweb, although it requires standing for 12 hours, not done nowadays, but in a resource poor setting, you have to diagnose, you take the sample, wait for 12 hours, so keep it one night. If it is a tubercular one, you will find a cobweb. Cobweb means jhul. Now, mapper size jhul. But I want a jhul over the structure. I want a dekti pave. I like to keep a redness, hemorrhage pave. If you accidentally prick or not, I like to hemorrhage of the pave. So, the initial period of pave, initial in the sample, you will ask the blood cell pave, you will start for a clear solution. So, 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 you will start for a clear solution. बाकी जरा क्लियर पच्चों देखते चुके हैं सही सैंपल टा पता है और एलिस बोलो तो बेचारे एक्सीडेंटल पीक हो चुके हो तो इनिशियल सैंपल टा तो हज़ार दो बेचारे रेड सेल रेड सेल चला सकते हैं बोलो तो वेल्ला उठाएँ तो किस वास्तव में रहेगा इट कैन हैपन वी नो तो इट कैन हैपन जैंसोक्रोमिय Clinician wanted, HOD wanted that what investment in the Ramasar said, uh, do it. And I demonstrated, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, visually one can detect the CSF because fuel is in color. So that made a confirmatory diagnosis. So blood in CSF will be having depending on the type of bleeding what happened. Particularly this type of case you will get in the first sample if you make an accidental pick. But if there is a real hemorrhage, you will get a CSF like this. Of course, this type of blood based. Uh, full of blood, and this is eulis discoloration. That means this is janthochromia. Presence of bilirubin is there. Blood is there, but that blood has been converted into bilirubin because it's a thyroid and hemorrhage. So hemorrhage will be there. So what is janthochromia? That is basically a light piece of RBC from where he will be released and converted to bilirubin. And for which, that's why you have to require at least 12 hours time. Once you suspect that this is a case of surrounded hemorrhage, and you want to reconfirm it, if you don't have any city facility here, or anywhere, if you want to, that you please wait for, give, start the treatment. But wait for two, 12 hours at least overnight. Next day, you puncture LP and you will get this type of picture, depending on the degree of hemolysis. If you get a little hemolysis, then you will get little uh, uh, janthochromia and this type of janthochromia also and janthochromia CSF is deep also because it is the hemorrhage amount of very high. So janthochromia is a characteristic feature of hemorrhage, particularly surrounded hemorrhage. One, this you must remember as I told you, albuminous psychological dissociation. See, there will be situations where the CSF protein will be abnormally high, but the cell count will not be Proportionate, though there will be disproportionate rise in the CSF protein. So, elevated CSF protein level in the relative absence of CSF leukocytosis is hallmark of Gulenberry syndrome. There is no other way to diagnose, confirm the case. In the acute phase, basically, the characteristic finding will be CSF will be protein without any elevation of white blood cell count. Because there is no inflammation. So, that's the characteristic feature of Gulenberry syndrome. So again, you just concentrate here, this normal viral meningitis, if you see, this will get a clear fluid or if the duration of the disease is a little high, then only permeability will be a little bit higher, so you might get a slightly cloudy turbid type of solution. That is the characteristic feature of viral meningitis. So while you are drawing the sample, from the appearance you will have a suspicion, only thing you will have a confusion between this thing and the bacterial meningitis. The bacterial meningitis is present if the presence is a little larger, you will get almost a similar type of result. Now, what is the finding of viral meningitis? That you concentrate here at the end, you have to answer the question. The appearance will be clear or colorless, or it may be slightly turbid. Maybe, if the, it is of longer duration. Protein will be normal or slightly increased. It will not exceed usually more than. 100, uh, it will be average uh, 20 to 80, not more, much, much, much more increase. Because that not, not much more inflammation is there. The glucose will be all of, almost normal because there is hardly any cell because this cell number is also very less. They will, they will, they will not be able to consume. Virus doesn't consume that much amount of glucose. 
So cell count will be basically typically 20 to 500. Of course, whatever picture I am giving, that is based on just for your understanding. From case to case, it will vary. If the severity of the case is high, obviously you don't get this type of classical picture. This is for your understanding. I have made it very simplified. And the cell type will be basically lymphocyte, predominantly. Suppose if infection is there, on top of which bacterial infection has occurred also. So you will get a mixed type of thing. So don't get confused. At this stage, I don't want to make you, I mean, confused also. Have a clear cut idea that a clear case of viral meningitis, you will have a mostly lymphocyte and the typically cell count will be 25. Glucose will be almost normal and CSF protein will be normal or slightly increased. But coagulation is normally not done, that coagulation study, uh, that will be nil. So bacterial meningitis, it will be invariably turbid, I repeat. Because there will be leukocytes, there will be past cells. So the moment you puncture, you will find a fluid which is turbid, make a professional diagnosis itself that this is a case of bacterial meningitis. And depending on the degree of infection, you can see this type of color, this type of color. And you can see this is a sank pus. Means this infection is very severe. And the amount of blood, you can see whatever blood is there. Perhaps you have accidentally pricked it. So that sample was pricked. Some prick, but that is not going to, I mean, uh, make any wrong diagnosis because it is full of pus. So no other practical investigation is required. Only by seeing the color, you will be able to diagnose. So as a clinician, while you are doing this CSF analysis, after you have completed this class, you must be able to diagnose on the spot itself what type of meningitis you are handling. And if you do not do it, perhaps again I will tell, I have miserably failed in teaching you. Findings in bacterial meningitis, color will be opalescent or turbid as a rule, it will never be cleared. Protein will be increased, marked, increased because the degree of inflammation will be high. The glucose will be decreased markedly because bacteria will consume that amount of glucose. And that is where it is a priority sample. So if you draw the sample while the patient is, the sample is sent in, in front of the laboratory. So on priority, immediately in zero or zero, zero minute time, the sample will be centrifuged and it will be analyzed. So if you allow more time or if there is a severe infection, glucose will be zero, level will be zero and I have found it. Zero blood, uh, CSF, zero glucose in CSF sample. And the fluid was just like a target. I told them, if you analyze the sample, perhaps you will get the zero, get it zero. And you must expect that thing also. And what WBS count will be very high, uh, 1000 to 5000. And since this is an infection, there will be polymorphonuclear leukocyte infiltration, where they will try to engulf the bacteria and try to prevent the infection. I mean, try to control the infection as much as it can. So therefore, it will be mostly polymorphonuclear and neutrophil count will be more than 100%, 80%. Coagulation definitely it can clot on standing, provided there is an adequate leak and there is a fibrinogen also is, uh, I mean, present there. So CSF glucose concentration is very low. CSF glucose concentration, serum glucose ratio, as I told you, if there is a diabetic patient, if you see that glucose level is high, at least we have as blood glucose level. And if the concentration is less than, the ratio is less than 0 0.6, you can see it because you see, see, I have shown here the glucose level will be decreased markedly. Again, I am telling you, if you get 100 uh, glucose level, maybe the person is having 400 fasting blood sugar level or 300 fasting blood sugar level. That you must remember. Uh, it can be less than 0 0.5. If it is 0 0.4, you just make a professional diagnosis. If it is less than 40, I am telling you. Less than 40 glucose, if you get and make a professional diagnosis, that it's basically uh, macular meningitis. That will be possible you know, when there will be confusion of turbidity. Because in the tubercular and viral and bacterial, there will be confusion if it is in a mild case. In that case, uh, this is, uh, that will be uh, suggestive. It can be seen also in fungal, bacterial, tubercular, carcinomatous. The carcinomatous cells, that will also consume very high amount of glucose. Because all cancer cells are metabolically active. They consume glucose at a much faster rate than the normal cells. So one thing I told you that it takes about 30 minutes time to several hours for the concentration of CSF glucose to reach equilibrium with the blood glucose. So whatever blood glucose you will, CSF glucose you will find today right now will not be the same, it will be affecting the blood glucose level four hours back. So until and unless the patient is given any, I think high glucose, uh, I mean uh, glucose fluid or any...
food which contains uh, which can raise the blood sugar level blood glucose level then only it will be almost uh, that 0.6 percent that that ratio will be applicable उंड If the infection is very severe, this is a gross idea just to give a given an, an idea as to what will be the approximate result. But again, depending on the severity, it can be twenty thousand, can twenty five thousand. You don't know. Even if it can be as low as here, I have written hundred. It might be ninety also. It might be eighty or so. If it is the patient, the patient is a little early. It depends entirely on the degree, but it is not usually uh, less. It is usually always you will get a more count. Always you will get a more count. Because the patient will not come on the same day, he will wait for one or two days time. At least fever is not receding. There is some symptom of headache, some neck rigidity, some problem is there. That's why he will present at least after three, four days. By that time, it will not be hundred. He will get more than hundred cell. So tubo cloud meningitis is again. This will be almost cloudy. Characteristic feature, as I told you, it will be cloudy slightly, and the cobweb coagula. This will initially form a network like this. And if you keep it overnight, you can see this type of coagulation coagulation structure. And it might, if it is very high amount, then you can get a almost full clot. That you will be able to visibly see. And in any setting, wherever you get a chance that you can collect a little more fluid, see, want to collect for yourself, keep it overnight. And in the next morning, you come and see. And next day also you see whether the coagulation coagulation is there. Try to uh, see the total protein level also. Uh, please go to the laboratory because laboratory manipulates. I have seen one case, five thousand report I got of total protein and make it a black diagnosis that is a case of tuberculosis meningitis. Forget about other results. I don't care for this thing. It is a case of tuberculosis meningitis because five thousand milligram per uh, deciliter protein cannot occur in normally in bacterial meningitis. So biochemistry is very similar and glucose level was normal. So, what will be the finding in tuberculosis? If you clear operation, protein will be increased markedly. Remember, that is one characteristic point of tuberculosis meningitis. Uh, glucose will not be that much low because tuberculosis bacillus doesn't consume that much amount of glucose, unlike bacteria. Cell count again, I am telling you, it is not basically basically high. It will be less than 500. That's why glucose level will also not be low that that much. A cell type again is a predominantly lymphocyte. Because this is a cell-mediated immune response type of uh, infection, so you will get mostly lymphocytes. And again, I told you, cobweb coagulum. This is not done routinely, but as a clinician in research for setting, you can do it. Keep it overnight standing more than 12 hours, you can find it. I mean, out of say 100 cases, you might find in 10, 15 cases. But once you see this thing, you will never forget. Okay. Now come to the this. This is the main comparison chart. Just like there are three types of jaundice that you must remember throughout the rest of your life. And remember that this was taught in your biochemistry class. And from this class itself, you will be able to diagnose this case properly. Okay, that is what I have told. That is exactly written in a uh, in a tabular form. Okay, this is the uh, almost end. Uh, this is the actual end of my own lecture. Now, now, now I am coming to you. This at the end. You will do the investigation. Now you have to diagnose. Now I am going to you. You just some of someone have a few. You just come. Hello. You are concentrating too much on mobile. Please come and teach us. Come. Chala, chala, boy. Aki jo koi rasta khola nahi tumhara. I am a thousand times more knowledgeable. I am a rigid. Bol lam. Tumko tumhara mobile use kholo. Jao chala class pora. Pora tumko pora pass kora tha baam ke. Hede ka chhe. Tumhara chhe. Amader hede kam kam nahi ko. तो मोबाइल 
हाँ कौन जा किसून लगला सर हाँ तो कौन जा बोगला हुआ मैं तब का तो मतलब बंद हो रही बोला तो बे रे लागू सिटी आते तब नहीं हो ना वो भलंतियार व्हाट एवर व्हाट एवर मैनेजर के लिए he see told bacterial any anyone is at the counter you have to tell this thing there no escape uh, at least I, i will not leave this class until all the all the classes are this, uh, i mean all of you have understood see at least told voluntarily at least i am happy at least she told what is the diagnosis how many i mean how many is in favor of bacterial diabetes bacterial diabetes तो बोलो बोलो हाथ तोलो जोल हाथ तोलो हाथ भर कर तोलो तो एक दो ही तीन चार तुम तो आठ घंटे तोले चो तो ठीक कर तोले घंटे तोले बोल अभी देखते हो वो अकाउंट देखो उनको चाहे एक दो ही तुम तो आठ घंटे तोले जो तुम्हारे सुना है बना तुम तो वो ना क्या कहूँ ठीक ठीक नहीं करते वो तो तोले जाए कहा� सी देखो तुम्हारे मध्य बोलते सुने जा क्लस टा प्रथम वही बोले एंड आई वांट दैट एवरी वन ऑफ यू मस्ट टेल साइमेंटेनियसली दाने एफ में एसो टीचर हिसाब से टू प्ले द रोल ऑफ टीचर यू कैन टीच यू हैव दैट कैपेबिलिटी आई एम क्वाइट हैप्पी टू कम एक्सप्लेन हाँ ग्लूकोज अच्छे आगे देखा तो मतलब बार-बार बोलने में शुरू कलर देखा बोलते बार बार तो ऐसे खड़ी है डायग्नोसिस हो गया जो तो उन्हें डायग्नोसिस हो गया जो बोलो एक बार देखा तो कहाँ ग्लूकोज ठीक फर्स्ट क्लास बोलो जो खूब भला बोलो जो देखो वो पॉइंट देखो एकदम खूब राइट जगह तो पॉइंट बाकी किसी कर दरकार नहीं देखोटिकल It's not in hundred. It is thousand. And again, neutrophil. Why neutrophil? Because neutrophils are trying to engulf the bacteria to control the infection. Wherever there is a bacterial infection, usually neutrophils come into the picture. Wherever there is an immunity, immunological reaction, lymphocyte will come. Remember, make it a point. Lymphocyte will be high in case of viral, in case of immunological disease. But neutrophil is a routine for the bacterial infection. Thank you. तुम्हें मोबाइल फोबल घटा बंद कर फेल कर फेल कर ले द्वित बच्चे साथ बसते हैं रूल कर दिए बोलते बाध्य हो कि कर नहीं क्यों बस क्या चुप कर बोलो क्या क्या बोलो भाइर चलो हाथ चलो हाथ चलो भाइर एक दू तीन चार पाँच छय सात आठ न दस एगारो बारो तर चल खाली पाए चलो ना बाबा कि देखते जाते ना चलो देखा ऐले मिले भाइरल बोल दो दस चक्कर भगवान भूत कम है देखे बोले जाओ चलो जाओ 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 अब आप चलो तो तुम आगे बोलो इसके लिए ना उनको बोल चलो जब भाईलाल तो तुम्हें बोल दे दूंगा रात को ना लोग बोल 90 परसेंट लोग बोल ले तो ये राहु ग्रास कोच्चे चौंध लोग हैं फेज़ में चौंध लोग कौन हैं जाओ क्या बोलो जाओ क्या बोलो आगे जाओ ऐसा ऐसा धाना ऐसे उनको ना बोल ले हवना � Every one of you have to uh, interpret the report. I repeat. 
At the end of the class, you must be able to diagnose properly. That's the purpose of this class. No patient will listen, listen to what is the, how the CSR circulates, all this, is what it is produced. But that's what you put me as a balloon key paper. ठीक कर मास्क कौन सी स्वतंत्रता का बोलना किसी भी के कारण में मास्क चेंज होता पार ना हो मास्क के चेंज पर दिखाता लो बाय टेलिंग द ट्रूथ बोलो जा बोलो 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 आई वांट टू हियर फ्रॉम यू सो जाओ 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 ओके एक्सप्लेन करो आप सुन ची हाँ बेस ठीक है जो भालो आर जाओ फिर जाओ तुम्हारे रिकॉर्डिंग हो जाते কবে কোকলেটা করে হয় না বারবার বলে যে কবে কবে নরমালি করে না বাট ও কথা বললাম তো বায়োকেমিস্ট্রিটা নিয়ে দেখি বলে দিব আমি হ্যাঁ প্রোটিনটা প্রোটিনটা কি আছে নরমাল আছে নরমাল তো প্রোটিন নরমাল কত থাকে কত থাকে বললাম নোট প্রোটিন কেউ বলতে পারবে নরমাল প্রোটিনটা কত থাকে লম্বা রিজনে 15 থেকে 45 বললাম না লম্বা রিজন না ওই লম্বা রিজন থেকে যেহেতু পড়ি আমরা কোন চ্যাপ্টার থেকে লম্বা রিজন নাম রাখব কোন রিজন গুলো তো মনে রাখব না জাস্ট আমাদের জানার জন্য বললাম তো প্রোটিন ইজ অলসো উইথ এ নরমাল রিজন হোয়াট অ্যাবাউট গ্লুকোজ হ্যাঁ হ্যাঁ তো সিস্টেম আছে এক তো থাকতে পারে তার সিস্টেম করে দাও ওকে হ্যাঁ তো ঠিক আছে মানে অসুবিধা নেই গো পেশেন্টের যে ব্লাড গ্লুকোজ 100 থাকে 100 100 10 করে থাকতে পারে তার সিস্টেম করে সেলটার দিকে দেখাও रिमेम्बर Meningitis like of structure, but you are not sure, and that's why you have done it. Now, at least you will explain when this you will get this type of result. At least that patient is not having any meningitis. Thank God, we got a normal report. That's how you have to damage control exercise. You have to make to save yourself, to save your colleague also. Okay, just correct for that. You know, some doctor has a constant report that is normal. चले <laughs> ठीक <laughs> 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 
এবারে ডকুমেন্টটা আপনি বললেন ওই ফুলের সাইড দিয়ে হ্যাঁ চারটা দেখি হ্যাঁ চারটা দেখতে ক্লাসে কিন্তু শুনলে বসে বসে চারটা তো আমাদের ভবিষ্যতে জন্য বললাম আমরা তো বলে থাকা যে তাই আস্তে ফন্দরে বকলাম তো বললাম যে 5 মিনিটের ক্লাসে শেষ হয়ে যাবে এত ফন্দরে কেন বকলাম আমি এটা মাথাতে ঢোকাতে চাইছি আমি তোমাকে বলো এটা যাও 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 ওখানে যাও হ্যাঁ তো কি ডায়াগনোসিস কি আমি লিখেছি কি উপর ডায়াগনোসিসটা বলো তুমি আগে ব্যাকটেরিয়াল বললে সাতকান্ড রান পর সেটা কার কাবাব ব্যাকটেরিয়াল বললে চলো ব্যাকটেরিয়াল বললে কেন বললে ব্যাকটেরিয়াল বললে আমাকে কেন ব্যাকটেরিয়াল বললে বলো रिपोर्ट ওটা তো ছেড়ে দাও ওটা করা হয় ইচ্ছা করে তোমাদের লিড দেওয়ার জন্য দিয়েছিল সেটা ওই মেয়েটা বলতে পারছে না তা তুই সারা ক্লাসে কিছুই শোনো নেই সারা ক্লাসটাতে কিছুই শোনো নেই মানে অ্যাটলিস্ট অ্যাটলিস্ট দশ বার আমি বলেছি কবে 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 কথা দেখতে পাচ্ছি না প্রোটিন কোথায় বেড়েছে কোথায় বেড়ে গেছে আমি বললাম না পাঁচ হাজার কেস ছিল ব্ল্যাক অ্যান্ড হোয়াইট আমি বলে দিলাম কেসটা টিমা ক্লাব ম্যানেজার হিসেবে অন্য কিছু হবে না প্রোটিন ইজ শো হাই चेस्टा पढ़ाशुनाथी तुम्हें छात्र बोझाओ क्राइटेरिया चिंता कर चिंता करो बस बस जो निजे तक बोलते बोलते 
परीक्षा दस बार हाँ से दिन ही रेजल्ट चलो खूब भलो तुम मैं रियलि गुड हो थैंक यू भेरि माच तुम बड़ा टीचार हो भलो टीचारिंग टीचिंग लाइन जाओ जाओ एक्सप्लेन करो जाओ 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 संगे जाओ हाँ मोर आज देख लो आज बोलो सेल काउंटर तो नर्माली देखा ठीक है सेल काउंटर बढ़ते पे अल्प बस भाइरल लिम्फोसाइट भाइरल और बैक्टेरियाल लिम्फोसाइट पा ये पा क्यों वही प्रोटीन का तक वही डिसप्रोपोशनलि अतटा पा ना देखो ये जो टीबाकुलर होत प्रोटीन लेवल क्योंकि अनेक बेसि हो जाए कूआागुल झेड़े आबा बोलिए बड़ा कूआागुल कराई है ना बारो घंटा क्यों सी एस एफ देखे ना तरह आगे डायलिसिस हो जाए सेल काउंटर थकतो प्रोटीन का सत्य थकते सत्तर का जगह चले आसते सत्तर ना पाँच सौ रोपण थकत बेपार बोझा गया ग्लुकोज का फर्टी थकते ब्लाड ग्लुकोज नर्मल इस्ट्रोजें प्रोजेस्टर फिमेल सेक्स हरम कल के एक नड़ाचाड़ा कर आई कूड मेक यू अंडारस्टैंड एटलिस्ट आई बिलीव द इम्पर्टेंस अफ Women power, importance of women power, and the whole women power lies with controlled and governed by estrogen. A woman is a woman because of estrogen. So nature, nature has provided this. Estrogen just should be human. I thought that too, na. इस्ट्रोजन ऑल एनिमल से थे तो बिहेवियर पैटार्न आई एम गिविंग एन एग्जाम्पल ए टाइगर एंड ए टाइग्रेस बोथ आर भेरि फेरस दो खूब हिंस बट स्टील इफ वन के दोज हू एनालज द कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स दे आर आर सार्टन डिफरेंसेस in the characteristic pattern of a tiger and a tigress is a characteristic difference da none other than estrogen why mother is a mother mother has got no alternative on this earth je kono prani je kono animal kingdom e including protein kano the simple answer is without going to any biological thing the simple answer is there was no question of any contraceptive procedure no question kichu chilo na no methodology did exist mane puro byapar tai jemon animal e hoy animal e je at a time tum if you look at बचरे एक सैकेल एक बार है सपोज हम गिव एन एक्साम्पल डग एक कूकुर चारटे बाच्चा है चारटे की पाँचा एंड आल्टिमेटली म्यूनिसिपालिटी करपोरेशन थे कूकुर कैसट्रेशन कर तर बार्ड कंट्रोल कराना है जस्ट टू टू प्रिभेंट दुएसेंस बींग क्रिएटेड इन दीट Street dog there, but they don't know. They have no procedure by which they can 
हैव देयर बॉट कंट्रोल तो इनफैक्ट नॉट लेस 1945-50 पर जन तो देयर वाज नो सच प्रोसीडियर बाय व्हिच ह्यूमन बीइंग आल्सो कुड कंट्रोल द बॉट सो आफ्टर दैट आस्ते 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 एक्ट एक्ट करे भावना जिंदा शुरू होलो दैट हाउ वी कैन कंट्रोल because after all we are human being ekta manush tar jodi tar next generation jokon hobe the upbringing of the children is very important i am giving my case my example my father's example out of 14 immediately after birth two died because tokhon system ta ei orokom chilo ekjone jodi 14 ta chhele me hoy thitrashtrer 100 ta hoychilo हंड्रेड यू अल नो तुम्हें चायनाफोर आई एंटर इन सैड एक तो बैकग्राउंड तो हमारे जानते हैं अभी चाइना थे देर वाज नो अने जोखन माउसे तुम यू हैव हार्ड द नेम ऑफ माउसे तुम इन माउसे तुम इरा ही ऑलवेज यूज्ड टू एनकरेज पीपल टू गो फॉर मोर एंड मोर चिल्ड्रन बिकॉज़ एट दैट पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम ही हैड दिस आइडिया दैट ए कंट्री इफ गेट्स मोर एंड मोर किंतु तातो है ना, because क्या ना है ना, the answer is our resources are limited, our resources are limited, आमादे जे population तादेर के आमादे कितने दीते होंगे, तादेर के बासुस्तान दीते होंगे, everything we shall have to government or the state I will have to provide. Now the time has come that India is also coming to that phase almost. Last Adam Sumari has told that about one crore forty lakh people. Ah, uh, sorry, hundred uh, forty crore people. Hundred forty crore people. No joke. So, at the end, we need control, contraception, and that is the most important aspect. And we need contraception, hormonal contraceptives. now the areas where we can control we can control the inception in the birth process at any stage from ovulation to impl- ovum implantation ovulation corpus luteum formation shekhano korte pari cleavage o korte pari morulato korte pari blastocyst e korte pari blastocyst implanting e korte pari and definitely we can remodule endometrium tumra to anatomy porecho e gulo ar amake ekhon nischoy bolte hobe na bolbe na endometrium ki sir khaye na matha jay so i believe you all know these things from your knowledge of anatomy so interception area coming to the hormonal contraceptive combination of oral contraceptive pills this is the most popular even today tv the ekta advertisement ashe unwanted 21 dekho tumra tv keu unwanted 21 idaning khub dekhchi tv the advertisement ashe so that means we are coming to that oral is the most popular route transdermal this is not that much popular this is popular for some other reason i will tell you there are some other procedures intravaginal ring injectable i will tell you about that progestin only not 100% effective 100% bole kono kotha kokhono hi hoy na a biological system hai just just Keep it in your mind in every way. In biological system, no such word exists which is called hundred percent. 
No. The answer is you can ask me why. Very simple answer. There is a simple term existing. Biological variation. Which I told you, na, the morphine or CNS stimulate kore. The CNS depression. Onik show me morphine er moto. Tumhe the pora nu je CNS. Why je? You know by this time what morphine is. Is absolutely CNS depression. But morphine is also at some point of time cause CNS stimulation. So anyhow. Saint Truman, it is a body of Rashi. Hormonal contraception in male, the still it is going on, still Akono Amra, Purupuri, Amra, a science of the good paradigma. The trial is on and on and on. Most popular, of course, combination oral contraceptive. Theoretical efficacy 99.9. .9. Basically, natural eight contents, estrogen. Or estrogen and progestin. Different phases. Ega you apply use kutte pari. Ki bhabe pari? In a monophasic way. Mane act a single phase chole. It takes up to popularly chole. But sometimes it is so happen. J monophasic ta may not be tolerated due to. Estrogen and progesterone both has got has its own hazard when we are giving exogenously. So that's why biphasic and triphasic and after cycle 28 days, amra is the cycle data boli that 21 days jyadi amra eta continue kori, we can have continuous prevention from pregnancy. Okay. Estrogen content ranges from 30 to 35 microgram. Low dose or modern pills, it may be less than 30 35 microgram. Progestin, progesterone, always variable. I am last chi for dose. Coming to the biphasic pill, what I use, why not? That is an ethanol estradiol 35, norethindrone 0.5. Those din day one money from the fifth day of the cycle. Usually the cycle continues from the fifth day of the menstruation up to 21 minutes, up to 28 days, and withdrawal. Then again the cycle starts. <coughs> Ethanol, estrogen, and non ethylene 11 to 21 days. This is biphasic, not the triphasic. Ethanol estrogen 30 microgram, not just 0.05 milligram from day 1 to 6, day 6. Ethanol estrogen, the asta se amra to escalate kori 40 microgram, not ethanol 0.075 milligram from day 1, D7 to day 11. Next is ethanol estrogen 30 microgram, and ekane progesterone amra body richi 0. 1 to 5 milligram from 12 to 21. Arecta 4 phasic pillow power jai. This uh, is called Natasia, estradiol valiate, and dinogest. So, these are the different physics, but monophysics is basically very important. Now, next is transdermal patch. It is a very popular noise. Can you not? No, the answer is very simple. We are giving in transdermally. Transdermal kuno patch jokhon dawa hai, their absorption will be variable. So, when absorption is variable, the chance of the risk of development of pregnancy will be more. It is purpose or no? Chita mi ashi. I am coming to that. So, kothai kothai mota moti lagano jete pare abdomen, upper outer arm. Upper torso, pite, or buttock. This is a common area. At a strip, lagida wa jete pare. A dose, 20 microgram and 150 microgram. Okay, clear. Intravaginal ring, ethanol estradiol, etanogesterol. 
इंजेक्टेबल्टाडियल डीएमपी ट्वेंटी फाइव मिलीग्राम वनस इन टू मान्स Coming to the mechanism of action, swara shori. I put that much. Which we did today, chole gala amra separation of hormone responsible for ovulation. Amra ki kote pari this combination progesterone estrogen B birth control pill only pill and progesterone only pills. Progesterone only pills. Can I? What are you talking about? Because when estrogen is more estrogen is more difficult and that is why women are very difficult to handle you know bole na glass handle with tears so estrogen as such is very difficult difficult why it has got number of hazards so sometimes we can think of they prevent the pituitary gland release from hormone that stimulates ovulation we all know arecta roll kothay hote pare it thickens the cervical mucus to block sperm sperm ta ke amra block kore dite pare this is this is the basic simple mechanism of combination either alone progesterone or preparation adverse effect thakbe मोस्ट कमन एडभार्स एफेक्ट छवि देखले बुझे पर होते मोस्ट कमन नशे हमिडी भेरि कमन और कि होते माइग्रेन माइग्रेन इज भेरि कमन उट्रोजें वेट गेन वेट गेन इज भेरि कमन एट चान्स थे and breast engorgement hote pare acne bolar dorkar nei eigulo shobi hote skin rash and acne okay serious side effects venous thromboembolism is very very hazardous thing venous thromboembolism ca breast it can sometime cause cerebrovascular accident also eta ki hypertension is very common are called stone the cystic duct are connect common bile duct eglo they can be affected so these are the serious adverse if side effects oh that is the reason prolonged contra indicate